Um, and Sam, what's your last name? Oh, uh, it's 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 a mouthful, man. What is it, dude? <laughs> what is it? It's Sam Tsavad. Okay, actually, wait, my, wait, wait, wait. My, my full <laughs> name isn't actually Sam. Like my first name isn't Sam. It's all made up. What is it? <laughs> it's well, my actual <laughs> name is Simo Patan Tsavad. Simo Poato. Yeah, that's great, man. Good Simo job. Simo Poato. That's was really it, good. Was that's that really, it? Yeah, that's, that's it. it. Am I butchering it? You're, You're totally just... butchering it. <laughs> <laughs> just stop. Just stop trying. <laughs> okay, so your name, your name is Sam. Your name is Sam. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Tivo uh, Patan <laughs> <laughs> Um, and you, uh, you traveled here, uh, to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you said you were 15, 15 years old. Yeah. What What made you Uh, what made you come to the U.S. Well, what was yeah, I thing? didn't do too super good in school. Um, so Let's like get this like a little bit actually, closer to you. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. No, I didn't do that great in school. I didn't really fit in, dude. Um, I grew up a lot watching a lot of American movies, so I feel like I'm always been more Americanized than like all my peers. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't really fit in, and my parents met in America, they were like, you know, what? you should go to America. It's a great learning opportunity over there. Since so I was getting bullied anyway, I'm like, you know, fuck it, like let's fucking go. So put me in a box, you want to put it in a crate, ship me over, see, and then put a carrot inside. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I barely survive, but you know. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know why that's so funny. That's hilarious, dude. Uh, <laughs> so where'd you move to? Where'd you move to in the U.S.? Washington State. Washington State. Mm -hmm. So is that where you went to Bellevue? Was that? Yeah, Bellevue. Okay. Uh, high Christian high school, which is interesting because I grew up Buddhist and going to a Christian school, but it wasn't that far off because my dad's Bo uh, my dad's Christian, like Catholic, and my mom is Buddhist. So I grew up with like two religion. Oh, yeah. so like a split household. It kind of, but not really. My dad didn't really care about his um his faith too much. It's just my mom would raise me to like pray and everything. So like mm. I have all these like Buddhist background. Then I'm going to like Christian school. And so like my belief was like crashing. Yeah, that seems yeah. like it would be very conflicting. A little bit. A little a bit. A little bit. But it's still good. Like what did your parents do here in the US? They they're not here. No, they're not here? No, they're back in Thailand. I thought they like I told you to put me in a box and then ship me over. Oh, I thought you said that they were here and they brought you over. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, okay, I got it wrong then. Okay, so they no, did literally kidding. just ship you in a box. Yeah, they shit. literally put me in a box with crates and carrots. I bet you were shitting yourself, dude. At 15, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Going to the U.S. <laughs> by did they at least uh, accompany you over here? No, you're kidding. No, for real. Like what the fuck? I dude? mean, I kind of half kidding when I when they said they put me in a box and ship me over because they just bought me a plane ticket and then like just sent me over here. Just you gotta yeah. go to America, man. You'll be Pretty good. Much. Yeah, that'll be good. You'll you'll be you'll figure it out. Dude, um, that's wild. Did you I, have anybody in Bellevue? Well, my aunt was there. Okay, so I lived with her for a little bit, and my grandma was there too. But pretty much my entire relationship with her was kind of like a room uh, renter relationship. So like. She would take me grocery shopping once a week and we'll get dinner and then that's it. I would never see her again the entire week. So I'll cook for myself, uh, take myself to school, take myself to and from practice, take buses, uh, things like that. So I pretty much like kind of have my own independence at like 15. Damn, dude. And at 15, did you ever feel uh, rebellious to just be like, you know what? I'm in uh, America. I mean, a little bit. Or is there's a fear of your parents just coming over to America? No, not really. No? Um, it was kind of like I'm just chilling. At this, okay. Yeah, I wasn't a super rebellious kid. Okay. Although once, because once I got like the freedom to come to America, it would just like do whatever you want. There's no parenting, so we're just kind of like, well, this is great. I guess I'll just play video games, do fucking homework, and then like go to school, do it all over again, things like that. So it wasn't that great. It's not like I need to like get the hell out of here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. Because that's how I felt when I was a kid. I was like, I need to get the hell out of here. I feel like here. every kid just have that though. Because like parents are so like in their business. Yeah. When I didn't have it, it's kind of like, ah. See, yeah. It's whatever. That's cool though. So, I mean, if you're in Bellevue and w when did you when did you join the military then? Like, it was like a year after um, college. Okay. So I tried to, college. It didn't work out. No? What did you go for? I was just general studies. So general like, study, okay. Just like whatever, like math, science, just taking classes for like the credits to go through like UW. Um, it's just not for me. Me and my mom made a deal. I was like, hey, I'll go to school for like a year. And if I don't like it, I'll go. I'll join the military. Because I was going to join right after um, high school. Yeah. Yeah, that, that Lone Survivor book, man. It gets you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, I feel like that's like every teenager's dream is to just be, you know, a Navy SEAL. 
and not really. Jump out I feel planes. like nowadays people are like don't like yeah, the military. Uh, not as much, but there's a lot of kids that play Call of Duty, and they really wish they're like, <laughs> yeah, this looks pretty cool, man. The military has gaming team now, which is really, really uh, weird. Dude, I know, yeah. man. When I was in, when I was at Lewis, yeah. we had the 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 Warrior Zone. They called it the Warrior Zone. The Warrior Zone. It was 36 PC okay. stations. With they were all tricked out with the latest graphics card for gaming. Okay. So all of the people in Fort Lewis could come in there and do their gaming, and you know they wanted to keep they wanted to keep the soldiers on base, so they would stop going off base and fucking shit up. You know, yeah, that, right? that makes sense. You know, the safety brief don't yeah. add to the population, don't subtract from the populations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, exactly, that's about it. exactly. So college didn't work out for you, dude. Um, yeah, I, I college is uh, college. Sucks, they work man. out for you. No, I swear I'm doing it now, but I mean I'm not really having a good time, dude. I mean, just quit. I'm, I, this is my last semester. Oh, and then I'm going just to quit. And then I'm go- just <laughs> <laughs> just quit at the finish line. I Don't mean, cross dude, it. it's like it's the last semester, you know. It's well, it also they also pay me to go to school. Oh, too. okay, yeah, yeah GI I'm bill. using the GI bill exactly. That's yeah, right. So. I haven't used it yet. It's a pretty good gig, but I mean, what you're doing now, dude? Yeah, I, mean, I, no. I don't need to go to college. What did you go? To, what did you go to the military for? Uh. So oh, bring this me- mic a little bit closer to you, too. Oh, yeah, I keep bit. leading back. Yeah, you're yeah. running away from the mic. I'm running away from the mic. <laughs> Things trying to catch me. Uh, medic. That was a medic. A medic? Yeah. Uh, isn't that in the Army? Isn't that like a whiskey? Yeah, 60 at whiskey. Whiskey? Okay, mm-hmm. sweet. Yeah, I knew it. I was, yeah. Good job. Yeah. Dude, every time I went over to the Army side, they were like, <laughs> what is your... MOS. MOS. And we would say, you know, two alpha, C, whatever. They're mm-hmm. like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, we're you know? totally off yeah. beats. Yeah. What were you in? Um, I was a jet engine mechanic on the C seventeen. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, it was a two alpha, five one Charlie or something. I, I forgot what it was. Gotcha. We didn't go by that. They, we said, "What are you? What are you?" And you said, "I'm a jet troop." That's that's what we said. Yeah, gotcha. Exactly. Um, and you said you did four years in Hawaii. Yeah. Is that where you wanted to be, dude? I know a lot of people. No, like I hate it. Hawaii. Awful place. You know, beautiful mountain. Ugh. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, a lot of people go to Hawaii and they get trapped. They, they feel do st- have island fever. Yeah. Um, which, which, it's really interesting because the military has a very like conservative kind of lifestyle, right? Um, people love like family oriented. It's really family oriented. And funny enough, in um, Schofield Barracks, it's one of the highest suicidal rate in an uh, off military base. Is it really? Because mm-hmm. we're so far away from families. And, you know, a lot of people from the military are like really form- family oriented. So it just feels like island fever. There's nothing to do. You can't go visit, you know, parents, things like that. It's hard for them to come visit them. So, yeah, it's wild. Like, I have to go. There's an incident, I remember. I had to go clean up this guy who, like, shot himself in, like, a container. Jesus. Like, yeah, I'm not going to go into it because, you know. Gross. Jesus Christ. Yeah, dude. but, dude, it's real. Like, it's a lot of, it's like, bad. suicidal in, like, in, in, a par- in paradise, which is ironic. Yeah, is I was gonna say, isn't that so ironic that you're in like one of the most beautiful places yeah. on earth, and it's got the highest suicide. But rates. really weird. Um, people who stay in the military in Hawaii, like they, they kind of do like the whole military thing. They just stay on base, they game, they do barbecue, um, they try to go to clubs and whatever. And those are not Hawaiian kind of like activities. I feel like they're not really connected to the island. They're not giving back to the island. Um, like for me, like I always go out like every weekend, go on hikes, go to the beaches and these activities, activities are kind of free. So might as well take advantage of it while you're sure, here. Yeah. But some, most people actually, most don't go out and explore the island. They'll go hike Cocoa Head and like, um, they go hike, they'll go hike Diamond Heads and they're like, oh, it's, this is great. And that's it. Dude, there's so many hikes on like Oahu. It's crazy. Like, wow. yeah, I did the Cocoa Point hike, which was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I see what you're saying, though. It sounds like, though, to me, you were more connected with reality in a sense, even though you video games and shit like that. But I mean, going from the Thailand to the US at 15 and then mm-hmm. raising yourself essentially yeah. and doing the things you needed to do, it's it just seemed like you were more self motivated and self driven. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd like to think so. Yeah. You know, I mean, but yeah, there's so much to do on the island, dude. I mean, I did, uh, there was one hike I did in the middle of the island. I just used that all trails app uh-huh. and found this trail. And I was like, well, this looks pretty cool. It's in the jungle environment. There's a, you know, a river or whatever. And when I went in to go into the hike, I was wearing tennis shoes. And the guy that was a Hawaiian guy was wearing spikes on his boots. And he said, yeah. that's what you're wearing. I said, yes. He said, Ugh. and he just walked <laughs> in. 
<laughs> and I didn't think anything about it, but when I walked in, it started pouring down rain. Yeah. So I put the Vivi over oh, my camera gear. Those happens a lot. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh my god. All but the time. The problem was, is there were so many switchbacks throughout the the hike, and the the trail filled up with water, so I couldn't mm -hmm. see my footprints anymore, and it was getting dark. I had no idea Good where times. to go. Yeah. So I would go down this way, and I would think, ah, I didn't, I didn't go this way. I go back. I went this way. I was lost. I was really lost. I was off trail. Let's say mm -hmm. for about an hour. And then when I finally came up, I took my shirt off. It was raining, pouring down rain. I was hiking fast, but I felt perfect. Like the temperature was perfect. It was perfect. Beautiful You can hike like yeah. shirt off. Oh, my God. Great. But when I looked up the hill, I just see this big Hawaiian guy with the hoodie on in the rain just staring, just standing there. He's just standing, looking down. And I go up to him. And it was him. Oh, okay. And he said, he said, man, I was worried about you. He said, I came out and I saw your car was still here. Mm -hmm. And I, he said, they call, I think it was Mocha Makai or something like that. He said the, the mountain rain, when it rains heavy in the mountains, he said, these waterways, if you're close to the water, can break and just wash you all the way out to the ocean or you can get lost. He said, a lot of hikers get lost in the rain back here. Yeah. And the fire department, they're just going to wait until the morning to come look for you. And uh, I just was super touched by that man. Like that was one of the most touching moments of my life to see that man just standing in the rain for an hour just to make sure I made it out. That's crazy, dude. Yeah, right. That's pretty nice. It's a Aloha spirit, essentially. It. He said the way he said it was, he said, "We are all we have." Mm -hmm. And he said, "You look out for everybody on the island." Mm -hmm. That's just, holy shit. Man. It's um, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. It's really that. weird because like people when they go to Hawaii, they always think like it's a vacation spot. Um, and like most of the people, uh, tourists that go to the island, they go in there with a the mindset, like, what I, what can I take from the island? Like, what uh. can I like go and like, who can serve me? Like, this is my vacation. Um, and that's kind of the mindset to go in. And that's why some locals don't like tourists. Um, but if you go in and you like go in with a mind, with a mindset of like, I'm going here to experience and to learn and like, you know, soak in and then hopefully get back, then they'll love you. Yeah, because I, I definitely heard when I was on the island, I definitely heard some rumors of them not liking white people. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard people muttering it too, like fucking white people or like this. I heard it here and there. One time I was taking a nap by a tree by the beach and I heard it a couple mm -hmm. times. Um, but seeing that, it just really, I mean, it just really touched me. I think you're right, though. The, the, a lot of the island just, it, it gets hit hard by just this cycle of just tourists coming in there. Yeah, partying it up, having a good fucking time, getting swifty with other friends, leave a bunch leaving. of trash on the beach. Yeah, 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 and it's such a beautiful place. Exactly. So you loved your time there, man. That's that's cool to see. And you said Schofield, Schofield, because I I drove past there. I went to go on a hike. Yeah, it's a butthole of, of Oahu. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I went to I went so I had base access. I went on base. There's a mm -hmm. hike. And when I got to the gate, there was two army guys that were standing there. Say, hey, the trails closed down today because they were doing fire drills or bombing some shit i don't know what they were doing and it just looked like jurassic park which you know a jurassic yeah. park was shot in a while of course so uh yeah it's a, it's a cool place there man it's super cool dude why did you why did you come back then oh <laughs> <laughs> well this is where <laughs> everybody asks this question yeah well um i met a girl in hawaii actually oh. and i met her on a beach uh things got serious really fast uh asked her out that same day went on like first date uh, found out she's on a cruise, like vacation. She's going back to Wisconsin. So we kept in touch. And then four months later, uh, we were married. Four months. Yeah. She must have been fine. Dude. Four or six months. Yeah. She was cute. <laughs> she was cute. I'm just messing with you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but for real, though, yeah. Yeah. So that's four uh, months is fast, dude. That's fast. Super were fast. Were you still in the army? Especially when we like didn't really date, date, because we like, we met one time. On the beach, like for first date. Mm -hmm. A month or two later, she came to visit me for a week, and then like a, a month or two later, I went to Wisconsin to visit her and then propose. Wow. Dude. Yeah. Were you still in the army? Yeah, you were. Yeah. That's why a lot of people in the military marry so fast because, like, you know, they the BAH and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Mm, I I know what you mean. There are a lot of people in the military. I don't know what it is. People that aren't. Excuse me. People that aren't in the military don't really understand the kind of mindset that it creates in you, not the discipline, make your bed every day, not the, but just the fact that you can be pulled away and you're like a puppet for the government. And they're just like, you're going to go here and you're going to stay here. Mm -hmm. It creates this kind of mindset of just do things as fast as you can because I don't know what tomorrow brings. Yeah, it does. 
It does. But also, you know, the military is going to pay for your, like, housing for when you're married. So, like, a the lot benefit of benefit too. A lot of there's a lot of benefit in like being married because they don't recognize girlfriend. They only recognize like marriage, and then that's it, right? right? Um, and she was pretty cool. I, we were young though. We were super young. So when we got together and got married, she moved to Hawaii. Uh, we had a lot of like fights and whatever. But after that, it was like mellowed out. And after the military, I went to Wisconsin, where she's from, and then like put her to college and lived with her for a little bit, and then. Didn't really th- things didn't really work out um, from there, so that's why I'm here. I'm not sure to be too nosy, but I'm curious. Do you feel like how being, dare you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you feel like did you feel like you were trapped? Uh, a little bit. I mean, you move from paradise to this, you know, state where it's snow a lot and it's cold and it's flat. You know, not a great transition, <laughs> no, but a lot of good things did come out of it because. I moved from like, cause I was doing like the whole influencer thing in Hawaii. This is why Instagram was like big and you can actually like your, your posts actually get engagement from like posting sure. a single picture. Sure. And I was going pretty good, I, but it didn't really quite, um, she didn't really quite support that part of my life, the whole like influencer thing. So I kind of like put it aside. So we moved back to Wisconsin. I'm like, I'm still determined to make photography work or like videography or whatever. Um, it's like, what do I do? Like, I'm, I'm in this God forsaken place. Like just awful place, <laughs> right? We're called Wisconsin. They just drink fucking beer and eat cheese. That's all they got. It's so um, true, though. It is. So I'm, I'm like, from Alabama, so I'm laughing. I know. I, yeah, I know how it is. It's kind of how it is, right? Yeah. Um. So I'm like just dabbing to some of these like different photography, side photography, like portrait, weddings, commercial. Um. And I'm doing a few weddings. And it wasn't really my calling at first because I'm like, this is this is fine. This is good enough. Like, it's make money. It's something I can do with my camera. But um, I think a year in after, like, I got out of the military, uh, one of my really good friends, his name is Cruz. We always go out, fuck some shit up, makes causing a lot of trouble. Um, he passed away unexpectedly. Oh, uh, man, I'm sorry to hear yeah. that, dude. So, okay. That's, that's tough. Well, what really, like, hits me is we didn't have any pictures together. Like, we have zero picture together. We never take a selfie together. We never have, like, just him and I picture, like, none of that. It's the only picture we have together in, like, the same image, like, frame. It's, like, a group shot of our platoon. But it, that, and that's it. And I, this is, like, a guy that I would come to all the time at, like, the barracks to do an IV on, like, a Sunday night because he's drink too much and we got, like, five-mile yeah. run the next day. One of the day. boys, man. Yeah. He was, he's one of those guys. So it kind of really, like, hit me and, like, dude, like, I'm forgetting about him now. Like, now that I'm talking about this, I'm like, I don't know what kind of things we used to do together. So it become kind of like my mission to make sure that all my couples, you know, get to live in a moment and have images they can look back on and live really at this moment again. So that's why wedding photography is big for me, like personally. Yeah, man, I see you all over the place, dude. I see you all over the place. You know, <clears throat> and you know, I saw you before. I told you this on Instagram. Did you? Months back. Mm-hmm. I didn't see you physically. I was going to say, stalker. Yeah, know? right. <laughs> yeah. I had that 150 to 600 just hiding yeah, behind a bush. Exactly. Uh, taking pictures of you. Uh, now, I saw your van that you were selling mm-hmm. on the marketplace. Oh, yeah. And I saw you yeah. in there. And it was funny because that's we're up to that point now to where you said you started traveling the van after Wisconsin, right? Yeah, after Wisconsin. So you got the van. Where did, where did you go with the van, dude? It's like been Which my dream. Sick, it was a sick setup, by the way. I think oh, thank it was you. Sweet. Yeah. It was my, it's been my dream to like live in a van for a little bit and travel. Uh, that's why things didn't really quite work out with me and her. I guess she wanted to stay in Wisconsin. She's a teacher. Uh, she's a great teacher. And like, full respect, that's her dream. That's her calling. I didn't want to pull her out of that. Her family's there. I just can't. I can't live in a snowy place like that again. I would break out in hive and die. And, spontaneously combust from <laughs> snowflakes it's actually it's not for me i was born in thailand in the heat not snow right <laughs> not me um it's too much man uh it's for, for me at least yeah for, for some people it might be fine but uh what was your question <laughs> well no i was gonna say that's uh, oh where did uh, i go in the van major respect to you yeah sometimes dude it's sometimes it's just as a person we are in this place and it's just not it's not, it's sometimes we just need a change or we have to do something wild, especially us boys. You know, sometimes we just got to run, you know? Yeah. Have you heard of that analogy of a shark in a, in a fishbowl? No. It's like shark won't grow um, bigger than their environment. Like if you put a shark in like a fish tank, it won't grow bigger than it's supposed to be, even though it's supposed to be like this giant animal. So like your environment kind of dictate. 
I heard it on a quote somewhere, but it's also something I heard on the internet. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, it's it's a good. It sounds a good yeah. like a good analogy though. But uh, there's also another story of like how okay, this couldn't go off topic. This makes more sense. But uh, a, a daughter and a dad. Uh, the daughter was inheriting a car. Like a dad gave her a car. It's an old car, and then the dad took told the daughter to be like, "Hey, take this car to like a pawn shop. Tell ask them how much you can get from it." Pawn shop said like maybe five hundred dollars. Um, you know, then the dad asked the daughter to go to a dealership. He's like, hey, see how much you can get for the car, like a few thousand. And then the dad asked the daughter to go to like this antique car like place and then ask how much you can get for it. And that place said like, you know, hundred thousand dollars or something like it's like a super rare car. So the moral of the story is that like, it's not about like you, but it's also like about your environment. You might be a very special person in certain environment and but in certain environment, they don't see the value in your life at all. Mm. So um, sometimes people have like a lot of potential, but if they're not in the right like mindset, they're not in the right environment, they're not gonna get there. So that's why I kind of left Wisconsin because I feel like it was limited me, limiting me a little bit. You know, that whole lifestyle. It's like not it wasn't me. your place to thrive, man. Not really. I like that analogy too. That's a good analogy. I have heard that analogy. You have before. heard that. That's, analogy. A, yeah. that's a great analogy. Is people. Sometimes you're in an environment where people can't see your worth or don't know your worth. Exactly. You know, only you know your worth, right? Mm -hmm. And so so from Wisconsin, you got the travel van. And then where did you go from there? Pretty much at that point, the COVID was a thing, right? And um, elopement photography boomed. And I kind of was... Can you explain that to a, a little bit? You, we, we touched on this earlier before yeah. we started the podcast about why it boomed. Okay, so in like COVID happened. Hello? Hello, microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, so when COVID happened, all the, you know, businesses shut down, all the venue venues can't host events because, you know, COVID. So couples are like, well, we want, we still want to get married, but uh, since we can't do that, we might as well go to like the mountain or something, just two of us, and then like get married from there. And uh, it just boomed up because it's so, it's such a cool concept. It's a lot cheaper for the couple to get married. Um, you don't have to deal with family drama. You can do it however you want to. You can go to some of these cool places. You save a ton of money. Um, you can hire some really good photographer because you save a ton of money. And it's not as stressful, man. It's it's just a, a nicer like change of pace. Uh, so for a lot of couple, it's a, like the calling. So when COVID happened, that industry just kind of boomed up. And my business, like I want to go in the adventure already. So when I have that set up, it just kind of took my business off. Um, so timing is good. Like I was really fortunate that that happened. Now there's a bunch of elopement photographers and I feel like the you know, pendulum is swinging the other way because a lot of people lost their friends and families in COVID. And because of that, you know, they see the values of having their friends and family at their weddings. So I feel oh. like the pendulum is swimming back toward big weddings. So I start offering normal weddings too, because I really do miss normal weddings because I used to shoot under, um, Lauren Ashley, she's a really big wedding photographer in Chicago. Uh, now she's in like Africa shooting weddings for like some really high-end clients. And she's like super talented. And it's always super fun to, you know, do this huge wedding. Um, and my personality, like I love, I love people, dude. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, all right, uh, I'll do both. So now it's swinging back that way and I'm pretty happy about it. But to go back to your point, yeah, it's living in a van, traveling for elopement photography. I would drive from... Chicago to like um, Arizona to California, up Washington State, come back to Arizona again, uh, swing over to Utah, go to Colorado, fly to Hawaii for a wedding, fly back, and then drive to Chicago for another wedding, then drive back here again. And so it's like all over the place, and I just travel for work. Yeah, dude, I've, what I've seen, it's like you've been all over, man. You're always somewhere. Which is kind of like a dream for like most creative people, right? They yeah. like travel and adventure. They love to go like, like live at these like, it's like travel lifestyle and making money from like remotely and just, yeah. It's so like I kind of live that life a little bit and like make, you make pretty good money too. Um, and it's fun, but you can't do that forever. Doesn't it drain you? Dude, it drains you a lot. Like you think it's like a super cool thing to be like, oh my God, I get to go to this place and this place and that place. I cannot wait to just have a whole month of no traveling. <laughs> I have been nonstop going to living off Amex Lounge <laughs> this entire time. <laughs> it was insane. Um, it's it's a fun life and I can definitely keep doing it as, as long as I want, but I do have different goals. Like I want to start a family 
at some point. So I'm gonna go find a like a lucky girl at some point. So you know, moving around also because you're so re- like no, you're so nomadic. Have making friends like a lifelong friends, like a really good friends, gonna be really hard. You have friends everywhere, but none of them gonna be like your really good friends that you have like Wednesday brunch with or like, you know, Saturday dinner with. Those are your like connection that. friends. Yeah. I have a friend in Hawaii. I have a friend, yeah, friend country, here, friend, friend there. there. Yeah. You talk to him a little bit, but that's kind of about it, right? It's nice it to meet up, catch up a little mm-hmm. bit, chat it up. Yeah. But I'm it's really, really like, I want to say it's really interesting that you said that about the pendulum swinging back mm-hmm. from the elopement photography. That's I didn't think about that from a business standpoint. You said you were very lucky when COVID hit. They said all all of the benefits, they saw all the value in doing these really cool hikes or going to these different locations and destinations and doing these these uh, elopements, you know, just themselves or maybe yeah. a couple other people too. And now you said that people lost their family in co- with COVID and stuff and these different things happened to where they see the value in having their family there yeah. for the photographers to capture them with them at mm-hmm. the wedding. And I didn't think about that, but that is, I could see how like the, the market changes rapidly. Yeah, and um, I would say Arizona is the best market for wedding photographer that like to travel because it's so hot in the summer. No one want to get married here, and it's really nice everywhere else. So you can travel in the summer, and in the winter when it's shitty and snowy, then you can just be here working. Well, I don't personally snowboard or like ski, so I don't need, need to go to those God for second place. <laughs> <laughs> but you know. <laughs> Dude, you and I are the same about the snow, man. Every time yeah. I'm in the snow, I'm like, I'm, for 10 or 15 minutes, I'm like, this is cool. And then I'm thinking to myself, get me the fuck out of here. Dude, dude, I went from laying on a beach in Hawaii to shoveling snow on a driveway. <laughs> it's it's really not a good transition. <laughs> I do not recommend anybody do that. <laughs> dude, that is tough, man. That yeah. is tough. But I did learn how to ski recently. Um, so that was actually a lot of fun. And it's kind of changed my mind a little bit. But I can't pick it up. I have too many hobbies. <laughs> yeah, it's expensive too. The snowboarding mm-hmm. gear, skiing gear, uh, and then like the injuries too. I I thought when I went snowboarding in Washington, yeah, that the injuries it's snow, it's fluffy, it's soft. No bullshit. Dude, it hurts. Dude, that's how I fucked up my shoulder because I ran into uh, a pothole in the snow and I just face planted, you know, and it dislocated my collarbone, and so. Yeah, it's, you know, for me, I'm just like, fuck that. I, I would rather be... You don't want to get hurt every single time you go up there? Snowboarding? Yeah. You I don't, don't want to break your collar bones and wrist? Yeah, no, I don't no? want to be in the snow at all. No. That's so weird. A lot of you love it. No, dude, I no? hate that shit. Oh, I'm right? just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you, when I was in Hawaii, I thought the same thing about snow or uh, surfing. Surfing, thought, yeah. Wow, this is the water is soft. You know, it's water, <laughs> the water right? Is soft. Right? Like, <laughs> if you fall in the water from standing on top of it, you're not going to get hurt. That's not far, you know? Yeah, of course. But then no, when I went no out there corals, and started, nothing like yeah, that. Yeah, when I went no. out there and started surf, uh, surfboarding, I started, you know, running into like, um, when I was going through the waves, of course, the waves are beating you down. Your your chest is hurting from, you know, that's just a lack of doing it, right? Like, I just need to be more conditioned, right? Mm-hmm. Getting out there, your shoulders are wearing out, and then you're out of breath, and you see a wave, and you start paddling, and then you go to stand up, and then you, you ride it for a couple seconds. It's a blast, and then you fall over, and then by the time you're done, you're exhausted. Yeah. I'm coming back to the beach. I have washed down a little bit, and I'm in this coil reef yeah. barefoot, and so the waves are coming up and down and i'm going up and down with it and then my lanyard gets caught on the coral reef Mm. so like it's pulling me under the waves like the you know it's just this fight and it's poking my fucking feet and i'm trying to like slowly and they're not like this smooth coral reef you see in finding nemo jagged as fuck yeah i just want to stab you yeah i just want to die so it's just interesting i do prefer surfing though more i prefer the water it's more of an adventure it's a whole other world dude when you're out there especially during sunset and you just it's just you and the water and like you and the waves. And there's no phone. I mean, like yes, you can bring your phone, but like like snowboarding, you can still like texting on a lift and whatever. But there, it's just it's just you and the waves, man. Yeah, so zen. It's so nice. And the ocean too is like this connection of reality. You know, it's you can you can swim against the ocean or you can learn to go with the flow of things. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of how it is in life. Ocean is just such a. A, a teacher of life. It's like stop fighting and just kind of go with it. I drink. You know? uh, I bring a lot of like, uh, what do you call it? A lot of values from nature. So I like to draw. Like, is this true or is this false? I just look at nature, um, and then I just you know, use it as like my guides for like life. Yeah. So like what you said, like water, go with the flow, right? Same thing. 
um, and like ever changing, like in life, you can't just stay the same forever. It's the season in life. You know, you're going to have like down season, you're going to have like up season. It's just how it is. You know, you have a little depression here and there. Like, it's okay, dude. You're just, <laughs> a, little, you're just a little sad. At It'll least you're fine. not stuck in Wisconsin in the snow. At least you're yeah. not in Wisconsin. <laughs> and if you are, you could get out. <laughs> That's how I felt when I was up in Seattle, dude. I mm -hmm. mean, did you, you were up there for a yeah. while. Did you feel that with the overcast, man? It well, was... I like, I really like it at first because come from Thailand, hot, humid. Oh, yeah. Right? I can only imagine. You're like nice and cool, like weather. After a few years, I'm like, this is not great, but I didn't know any better because I had never really been to any other states. Um, but once I left and go to Hawaii, I was like, I'm going, I'm going back to Seattle again. Also, I was a very different person in Seattle. Yeah, I was a really shy, introverted kid. Like that's just because you moved from a another total country. Loser. Yeah. <laughs> well, you moved from another country to a place. No, no. I was before I moved. I was still like a really shy, Were you? introverted oh, okay, kid. Okay. Like, okay. Yeah, it was not good. I didn't like who I was. So I'm sure the military broke you out of that, mm -hmm. right? That's what broke you, got you out of your comfort yeah, zone. and pretty much. Just make, give me, like, thicker skin, essentially. That's what it did for me, too. It changed me. I was a completely different person before and after. Uh, but I want to go I want to go into the elopement, like, business yeah. and how you started. You said you, mm -hmm. you wanted to get more into the content creation, yeah. uh, influencer-type stuff, and you were in Wisconsin. It was a bad condition for you, so you hit the road in the van. You started traveling. How did you find... Um, how did you find the clients to work with? How did you market? How did you how did you make that thing happen? Okay, so there's there's different ways to skin a cat, right? Like you can do it many different ways. You can do SEO. You can do like Instagram and TikTok. You can run ads. I ran ads for a little bit uh, on Facebook uh, before, like you know, iPhone privacy was still a thing. <clears throat> Sorry, this. Thing in my nose. No, dude, you're good. I've been sneezing a shit ton since the the weather's changed. It's like allergies, man. But yeah, um, how to find how to find leads for your elopement business? I would say if you want to start, you have to specialize in a certain locations. So it's not great to be like I'm an adventure photographer, but adventure photographer for what exactly? Because when a couples when they want to get married in like a like a location, let's say Banff, Canada. They're not gonna search bam. Uh, they're not gonna search adventure photographer and then look for someone to travel over there. They're mostly gonna search for someone who is a local there, specialized in that area, and photograph those mountains a lot, right? So if you're in Arizona, try to take advantage of Sedona. Try to take advantage of Grand Canyon. You're in this like really epic landscape, so take advantage of it. Specialize in that one location, and then from there you expand. <laughs> Oh, my bad. No, you're good. Like, mute this. I had the... Allergy's killing me. <laughs> <laughs> I had my phone on loud for that timer to go off. To make sure this is still in focus. Is this looking focused at you? Looks good. Looks good to me. I just, my face going to break your screen. It looks kind of hideous. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, let me let me put my phone on mute. I think the, the alarm is still going to go off regardless. But yeah. what sucks is, is... Uh... Oh, my brother messaged me because I didn't answer. Uh, you still alive? Should... No, nah, he didn't say that. He said something mean. Probably shouldn't say it. But uh, anyways, continue, it's, it's please. It's okay, man. It's, continue. Um, so like finding leads for your elopement photography business. You can establish yourself as an adventure elopement photographer. However, you're also competing with everybody around the country. That's not a really good business move. Uh, if you're in, you know, let's say Alabama or let's say, let's say you're in Ohio or like shit like that, where there's not a lot of like epic national park going on. You're just, in a, you're just at a disadvantage. If you live in those area, there's just not a lot going on for you. So just move. I would just, just move. Um, make sure you have portfolio that show that you do that kind of stuff. Because if you don't have the portfolio to show that you do these kind of stuff, no couple is not going to trust you, right? So that That's one thing. So do like start off with some style shoots, go out there, buy a $60 dress, which is what I did. I bought a $60 dress from Amazon. I found this couple um, who I didn't never met before. Uh, we went to Grandfather Mountain in North Carolina, and we did like a style shoot there. Um, the guy proposed to her during the shoot, so which is super epic. And wow. then they became my client, and they eloped in Yosemite, uh, and that Yosemite elopement kind of launched my elopement business. So that's a lot of like connection that you gotta kind of start at first. Um, so that's one thing. Make sure your portfolio is set up. Make sure that you establish yourself and you have a really strong brand for it. 
because for me, I don't get as many elopements anymore because my brand is both big and big weddings and elopements. So I technically don't really get a lot of those like, oh, I'm going to go hiking in Yosemite. I'm going to go to like Lake Tahoe. I don't get those anymore because my brand has changed. But if you're really adamant about going out there, make sure your brand is super out there. Delete every big wedding things you have uh, on your website. And then once it's all set up, now it's become marketing. So you can do many different ways. Obviously, the SEO, which is like Google type of stuff, write blogs about it. But you have to write blogs about specific location if you want to go there, right? Uh, it takes time for it to get picked up. And you might not see result until like six months or eight months down the line. If your blog actually, like it's good. Because um, some blogs are pretty shitty. Excuse me. <laughs> Oh, that feels good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can do Instagram or TikTok. Uh, it gives you tons of reach. And that's probably the best way to do it if you want to go somewhere else and if you want to be more broad. But the thing about it is, though, you got to keep doing it and you're stuck in that kind of endless loops of despair. You just have to keep pumping out content. And I love making those, so I don't mind them. But if you're not this, this kind of person, then maybe you can run ads. That could be another one. Um, just a lot of grinding. Pick pick whatever you think you're best at, like whatever suits your personality. If you love being in front of the camera, if you love creating content, then leverage TikTok, leverage Instagram. It's great right now. It's a really powerful platform. So might as well use it. If you are more of a writer, you're not really into this making um TikTok and Instagram. Yes, you can do, you know, ACO. You can go to like you can like uh, do like what do you call it like a Denver networking but the thing about Denver uh, vendor networking is there's not a lot of vendors to network with when it comes to elopements because you can't be friend with the mountain right mm. oh, versus you can, point. You can be point, friend yeah. with the venue here you can be friend with a planner um, there's not a lot of elopement planner out there most photographer most elopement photographer that specialize in elopement they are also planner they're also planner so that it's it's hard to for you to like network with anybody. Um, another thing is because barrier of entry in photography is so low now. You can go to Best Buy and grab a five hundred six hundred dollar camera. And it's amazing quality. Sure, yeah. And because of that, your work has to genuinely be good. If your work is kind of mediocre, they're not gonna fly you out to places. There's no way. Right. Um, and you so you have to be exceptionally good for them to even consider you to. F- to pay extra for you to fly out. Um, your personality has to kind of stand out a little bit. You can have to connect with them. So if you just start, if you send them like emails replying like, hey, I'm excited to be a photographer. Thank you for reaching out. It, it doesn't really scream a lot of values. So do whatever you can to make sure that your potential client feel special. Uh, show your personality a little bit. So that way, when you, how, how do I say this? When you have such a strong brand present, like your personality is such a strong part of your brand, no one can replace you. Like there's no like, let's say like you have a really strong personality on on your brand and they want you to, uh, someone like you to photograph like a wedding in Thailand for some reason, right? They can't find another jig in Thailand, so they have to fly you out. Mm. I like that, dude. I like that because when I think of Apple, I think of Steve Jobs because he built his face into the brand. He, He didn't make the the Macintosh. Yeah. He was actually one of his friends. He was just the marketing genius behind it. Mm-hmm. Where now when you think of Apple, you think of Steve Jobs. I don't know who the CEO is right now, but I don't think anybody thinks of it. Tim Cook? Yeah, but when you think of Apple, you still think it's Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. But yeah, essentially, make sure that you're irreplaceable. Um, because if you, if you are kind of like everybody else, you're replaceable, right? Mm. If you look like a photographer in uh, California, in, in like Yosemite, then why would they pay extra for you to fly over there when they can hire someone who is just kind of like the same, right? Um, connect, if you can connect well with your client and make sure that like you care about their their experience um, and you guys are like vibing. It, it's like, dude, I have so many couples, like I can't imagine anybody else capturing my weddings just because I'm, I have such a really like, like a certain, I'm a certain way with my personality and like my brand, how I interact with my couples. That couple of you are gonna just love me, or like it's just gonna hate me. Mm. Um, Which the ones that hate you is just more of a just not a good fit. I did never photograph their weddings. It, they never get past that like consultation period. Where so it's, it's just like, not a good fit. It's, it's not, not a it's good not fit. Even, it's yeah. not that you're a problem. You need to change your brand. It's just that not it's really. Just not a yeah, good fit. we're not a good fit for each other. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So that's kind of how it is. That's. Uh, let's see what else. 
oh, um, this is like a hot take. Uh, I know that some people are introvert, and a lot of introvert people are drawn to elopements, right? And they're drawn to, um, like, because it's more intimate, and you're not having to like be extroverted at a wedding. You have to have high energy, mm -hmm. and I think you have to have that kind of high energy when you photograph big weddings. So introvert might really benefit from elopement photography because they're in that more in, like intimate settings. But at the same time, I feel like when it comes to like a wedding industry, you have to be outgoing. You have to be a people person because if you're not, like, that's more like your job. Like more, your job isn't really so much to like create, I know, like when I think of wedding photography, it's, it's your job is to not create the best image possible, but it capture those moments for people. Like mm. their experience come before your image. I like to think that my image aren't even that like special, but my experience with the couple is what, you know, more special than the image. So um, if you can communicate that, right, like your experience, like how you treat your client and they can't get it anywhere else, they're going to fly you out. They're going to take you to places. They're going to pick you over to a photographer, things like that. It's the the uh, emotion that you're evoking with mm -hmm. the experience with them, right? Yeah. Because I, I know what you're saying. I mean, you can have a good picture of somebody. Anybody can take a, po a photo, right? right? Slap a 50 millimeter 1.8 in there right. and then take a good go to photo. a sunset place and then you can just... But what emotion does your client get from seeing that photo? Like, what is their emotion? Is it is it good or is it bad? Oh, terrible. I hate every fucking photo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, could you imagine it, though, if you're... This guy who's uptight and you have to have everything perfect. And I'm mm -hmm. sorry, guys, one second. I need to change from F2.8 to F1.4. Yeah. Don't listen. Just let me yeah, do my exactly. thing. And you're really stiff and you're all numbers and mechanical. And sure, you're getting this great shot because you're really dialed in on the, the, the yeah. your craft. Yeah, your craft. But if they don't feel mm -hmm. the good experience, when they see that picture later on, they're just going to see that uncomfortable experience. You have to like, because I know most creative perfectionists, you have to let that go. Because if you're still a perfectionist, you're going to miss out on moments. And off, actually, pe most of my couples, when I give them like these really cool like lighting images, that's not really their favorite images. It's usually like, a really simple image of them and their family. So like, even though your shutter speed is too low or too high, your ISO might be a little high, your image isn't as clean, or maybe the f-stop is a little bit too much. It doesn't really matter that much as long as you get those moments. Um, so that's that, but that's a really specific advice for wedding photography. Okay, mm. I, I could see, but if you look at a lot of uh, famous pictures in history, yeah, I was really blown away by the fact that a lot of them, dude, are out of focus or blurry or fucked up in some way that that you notice it as a photographer. And you're thinking to yourself, like, but, I, you know, it's out of focus. Why is this so famous? And it's just, it's not about everything being perfect. I don't know it's if about I know any out of focus famous a lot images. Of, so. A lot of film photos, if you look at them, they're mm -hmm. slightly out of focus. Well, the technology wasn't as good. Well, sure. But it's if you look at the photo, though, a lot of them, there are mistakes that are made in the photo. Maybe the composition wasn't as good. Uh, maybe the lighting was too harsh. It was too dark. But a lot of it is it's more, it's... So like about capturing the moment, like the okay, let's say a picture of a tank and a guy who's standing in front of a tank. You know what I'm, what I'm talking about? I don't. I can't think of that photo. There was a photo of a, a tank going down a road, and there was like a, a one single person standing in front of it because there was like a cold during Cold War or something okay. like that. So that picture was uh, really famous uh, because it's tell a story of like that time. But it's really simple. The biggest thing is like the story, right? Like, can that picture evoke emotions and tell a story? Because at the end of the day, you can take the most epic photos ever, but if it doesn't evoke any emotions, no one really care. And if you have to go through a lot of trouble, if a couple has to be super awkward about their experience, they're not going to like that picture, even though technically it's great. Which brings me to another hot take. I feel like females are better wedding photographers. Okay. Yeah. And if Give me the spill on that. I 100% believe that. First, um, you work with the bride, so you can be in a bridal suite. You're not going to miss any moment because as a guy, like as me, like I can't be in there when females are changing, dressing. right? Yeah. yeah. So that's one thing. Most females are better with like social, like interaction, social cues than like men's are. Like EQs are higher, right? They can pick up on like little social cue better. Um, I'm not saying all, right? Men's are better at like technical stuff. We understand f-stop, focal length, compression really well, very fast. We can work with flash and like create some really stunning images. But you know, at the end of the day, like, do you prefer someone who's more capturing the moments or someone who's like create 
like art. So there can be a best of both worlds. That's what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to be like that one in the middle. Um, but just different styles. There's nothing right. There's, there's no right or wrong about it. Mm -hmm. But I still do believe that like because of nature of the wedding, females are better at wedding. Uh, there, I think there are more wedding photographers that are female. Mm -hmm. I think there are. Yeah, and that's probably why. And they, yeah, females <clears throat> are generally more in touch. Like you said, they have that uh, the ability to be able to be with the bride the entire time. You're mm -hmm. right, hundred percent. And then they're also just really in touch with the way that everybody's feeling. Yeah. You know, like, how's everybody feel? Because for this? me, sometimes I'm just, like, so oblivious. I'm like, wait, you were mad at me? I was like, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I fucking yeah. had no idea. Huh? What are you Did talking about? Did I piss about? you off? <laughs> oh, all right, good. Yeah. <laughs> you hit him with, like, the Jocko, good. 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 Yeah. <laughs> good. It'll make you tougher. Yeah. Um, got cancer? Good. How do you... Oh, my God. How do you... How do you... Um, um, how do you manage all of the traveling you're doing right now? Because I like I, we I said don't. before, I just you don't holding on by the string I'm about to die. To so you just figure, it, dude. If I feel like okay, so I know you're joking, but there's probably some seriousness to that as well. I'm gonna back over the mic a little bit. I'm talking too loud. Um, I feel like like you said when you first started doing elopements. Um, I want to say I just saw you in Buenos Aires last week, and I've seen you in other places. It's crazy. Um, when you started doing elopements, you said you were you bought this sixty dollar dress from Amazon. You met a couple. They actually proposed there. They became a client, and then it just started going uphill. That is, like, essentially is the fake it till you make it type shit. Right? Pretty much, yeah. Like, just bullshit your way mm -hmm. to the top. Yeah, right. And I feel like a lot of people don't understand that. That's how everybody is. If you look mm -hmm. at, for example, Amazon, the biggest company, like the most. I think it's the biggest company in the world now. Yeah, Amazon and Apple, one of those two. Yeah, I think Amazon's the biggest company in the world. Jeff Bezos is the richest man on the planet. Yeah. And if you look at Jeff Bezos back in 1999 or whatever, dude, he had a sign that was hung up that was like <laughs> hanging down by one string that had spray painted Amazon on yeah. it. Yeah. With spray paint. The richest man on the planet. This was him. So hey. like everybody at some point was just trying to figure out how, what, What's the next step? Like, what's the well, next thing I could do? People overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. I like that. That's heavy, dude. Kind of hit me for a second. I had to think about that for a second. That's heavy, man. I tried looking through your soul when I yeah. said, <laughs> got uh, me. <laughs> yeah. I feel, I feel a little invaded here, man. <laughs> um, yeah, no, dude. I think you're 100% right on that, man. And so so for you, you're just saying, like, just, just get, pick up a fucking camera. Just go out, do what you need to do. Be honest is the main thing. Hey, have you ever done this before? No. And well, then you just, you know what I mean? Yeah, essentially. You I, what I, what I see the biggest mistake, what I see with new photographers and a lot of people in new business is they immediately go into this cowering state of apologies, right? I, I, I've never done this before. I hope it's okay. Like, I just want you to know, uh, I'm not really experienced with this. I, I, I think I can figure it out, but like, blah, blah. and it just, it comes across as weakness. It comes across as lack of confidence, insecurities, you know, to where if you just go out there and you just, there's a saying, the person who speaks first loses, right? Mm -hmm. In sales. If you just go out there and you ask them some questions, what are you looking for? What do you want? Okay, let's go do that. Have you ever done this before? No. And I mean, then you just, you know, you know what I'm saying? That sounds a little weird. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is, is I, okay, here's a better example. Instagram followers. Okay. I'm sorry I only have 500 followers. Or, hey, here's my Instagram. I only have 500 followers. Okay. Never fucking say that. Because mm -hmm. you're, like, apologizing to somebody for mm. something that you shouldn't be apologizing for. It doesn't for. really matter anyway, to be honest with you. No, it, no that, <laughs> doesn't, that doesn't matter. But I think that's an example of how, how we can approach things. Is if, yeah. we have, if we're not sure about it or confident... We'll immediately start apologizing for it when we shouldn't. We should just, just go. Yeah. Try your best. I feel like you do that when you have no evidence of like your, like your capability. Like let's say I never touched like ski before, right? And I'm like, oh yeah, I can approach it confident, but really like I really have no idea what I'm saying. Um, but I know what you're saying. Like don't apologize. But just like, hey, look, like I've never done this before, but like I would love to like you know shoot your weddings. Exactly. I would love to like do exactly. it. Exactly. Um, you don't have to pay me a lot. Um, but I would, I would love to do it for you. Right. That's the mm -hmm. difference. It's just the approach of, uh, not being this like cowardice, um, or apologetic state mm -hmm. of apologizing for something you didn't do. Cause the, 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 the fact is that most of the time people don't even know anything about it anyways. So you're like, Hey, I'm a new photographer. I don't know what I'm doing much. And they see that you've done a couple of good photos they're, they're, they don't know anything about cameras. Yeah. For, you know, most people can distinguish between a good photo and a great photo. They can distinguish between a bad photo and a good photo. 
Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's the same thing with acting too. You don't think if somebody is a good actor, you, you when you watch a movie, you're not like, whoa, that's some good acting. Sometimes yeah. you do, but when you watch a bad movie, you're like, dude, that's some fucking terrible acting. Yeah, like that's rough. You notice mm -hmm. it? Yeah, I, I like that. So to the elopements and uh, just getting out there and doing whatever you can to go do it and just one, one foot in, in front of the next, one step at a time. And so now you're traveling the world and you're doing this, these things all over the place. Tell me a little bit more about that, how you got that started and how you're managing that right now. I mean, like, how do I travel and stuff? Yeah, how do you do it? I mean, it's pretty easy when you, like, work 25 days a year. Like, you can just, you go to a wedding, right? Like, I, that's all I do. So I have 20, I book 20, 25 weddings a year and that's all I'm going to do. Um, and after that it's editing. So I have time off to go to like music festival or I can go backpacking Europe. Um, it's great because if your friend call you like, Hey, want to go to Switzerland with me? Uh, I leave in three weeks. I'm like, sure. Okay. I can, I can take like, you know, a month off and then go to Switzerland with you. And then, yeah. Um, but it's a lot of, I'm not sure what the question is. Like, are you trying to? Uh, well, well, it's so okay. I'll, the question is: is it, I'm going to put myself in the state of a, a typical person. Okay. Traveling is a terrifying thing. Stepping out of your comfort oh. zone, right? Traveling in general, traveling to a new country, mm. you may not speak the language, you don't know the people, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> visas, passports, whatever. It's a lot of steps. So, like, how do I do this? It's not the norm, right? Yeah. And then on top of that, now you're doing that, but you're also getting paid to work for a client in mm -hmm. an environment that you're not used to. Mm -hmm. Then you're trying to figure out how do I pay my bills? You said you did 25, you know, weddings a year yeah. approximately. How do I manage my time, enough time to edit? How do I manage enough time to market for phone calls, for client interaction? Like there's a lot. Okay. That, you see what I'm saying? Like, how do you manage all of that? Dude, um, I'm still amazed that I can still do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, how am I not going out of business by now? Um, I'm not the best business owner. There's times where like I fucked up my travel, like, oh shit, the plane ticket I'm supposed to book, like it's booked out and now I have to like reschedule a shoot. So you do learn throughout your like career, but like, okay, this is something you're supposed to do. This is something you're not supposed to do. Um, cause I definitely like fucked up before. Um, but it's just staying on top of it would be great. Like, like the Google calendar is a great, like that's like my life. If, I'm, if you're not on my calendar, it doesn't happen. So like my wedding's there, like me hang out with my friends are there, my haircut's on it, like my trips, everything's on it. So that way when things don't like overlap, essentially. Um, but yeah, once you do your weddings, 25, like, you know, let's say you have a season. So October is really busy. Like summer here is really open. So you can just go travel in the summer and then make sure that your weddings are like done and edited and you just have the time off. But when you're an amateur, when you're like a business owner, you don't really quite have a time off. It's hard to switch this off. Sometimes I'll lay down at night. like, I should probably do this at 10, mm -hmm. at 10 p.m. So I'll get out of bed and I start doing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so having like that on off switch is like, super crucial for your like mental health, uh, which is why I don't have any mental health left. You know, it's, <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but I love the honesty, man. That's fine. I, I tried therapy. They kicked me out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I don't know, man. It's okay. Uh, so let's so to make it. And I see what you're saying. My question is a little broad. It's kind of broad. Yeah. yeah. So let me narrow my question down. So if you're doing 25 weddings uh, a year, you said you did most of them heavier seasons in the winter. So like the third, well, fourth quarter. more like spring and fall. Spring yeah, and fall. Yeah. Okay. So you're doing more weddings than. So let's just say a typical week, seven days in a week. Okay. Um, you're doing 25 weddings a year, so that means you're doing about a half a wedding a week. So one wedding every two weeks, yeah. just roughly. How much time of the, for a wedding are you allotting to edit for that wedding? Well, um, roughly. I could get at a wedding done. What well, depends too? It's sometimes I'll be in the mood for it. Sometimes I'm not. Mm. Which is like the beauty of like you know controlling your own schedule. Sure. Like I'm gonna be in a mood to edit a photo right now. I don't have to do it. I can just go ride my bike and that's fine. So a it. wedding, well, my delivery time is eight to 10 weeks. Hmm. So that gave me enough time to like, let's say for some reason I go on a highway and I, you know, go T-bone in a car. I, I can go and, and get in the hospital and then come back and still edit your photo and deliver it on time. But I still have trouble with those, you know, because with all the travel stuff, I have trips I'm hosting in Thailand, which I'm leaving next week. 
and I have two weddings I gotta edit still. I think it gotta be done at the end of this week. So I'm like pulling my hair out of my face right now. Um, buying a house. So like a lot of life just happens and you just never really have a downtime as a business owner. You're always doing marketing. Um, so like staying on top of those photo editing is pretty crucial. I would say like if I really just sit down, anchor down and just edit and no distraction at all, I can get a wedding done in about like two, three days mm. probably. Um, but that's like eight hours a day, like not like deterring my face out or anything like that. Um, but it's kind of like, um, people are going to listen to me like, wait, so you work, let's say like 25 weddings a year, you make six figure. So like, that's, that's like absurd. Like that's crazy. Like you must be like, have all the free time and all this stuff, but it's not, it's not always like that. It's not that like, okay. Cause when when people look at you like oh that you must be so lucky and it's like like how do you do that or like how like what does that feels like and like how's that fair like that's a big question like how's that fair like I'm busting my ass working fifteen dollars an hour at like this thing and you get to like go take photos and then I'm um, traveling on the world like that's kind of unfair right from the outside perspective um, and yes that is true that I get to do this I'm really fortunate really blessed but at the same time it's kind of like the value equations. Um, the things that I do um, and the experience I give the couple is worth that. And that's people that have to realize that like your time, you're trading your time for your money is probably like the worst thing you can do because to like work $15, $15 an hour, you got to go in there and just spend your hours to do that. But let's say in that one day of a wedding, I can provide them this amount of value, this amazing experience and how much is that worth to them? And that's why like being a business owner like is so cool. It's like you can charge what you're worth right? You can improve your skill and charge more. So it's not the questions of like, like, how do you do it? But it's like, how much value can you bring? Mm. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Because in a natural market, if I go up to order a Subway sandwich here mm -hmm. in Arizona, and the person who's preparing the sandwich for me, how much, how much of that time to make that sandwich? What's that valued at? It's valued at about $15 an hour for mm -hmm. the person to do it. Exactly. I see what you're saying. What is the value of getting a wedding photography done in a mountain in South America. Yeah. There's a, probably a lot more value in that because yeah. it's the travel, the expertise, mm -hmm. the logistics behind it, yeah. the planning, the editing, everything. Yeah. So there's a lot more value. Right. What's that. the value of like creating a piece of device that you connect you to people across the world? Quite a tremendous value. This, this is a miracle right here. And like, I know Apple is a trillion dollar company and it's, that's why, because they literally. I never even thought about the iPhone. Yeah, that's, you're right, because these things are about. I mean, my iPhone when I paid for it, it was about eleven hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I guess you're right. There is a lot of value. So, like when you look at like billionaires and millionaires, right, and you just like envy them. Don't think of them like that. Like, look at like what they actually do. Like, what kind of value they create to the world, and if it's like you know worth, like it's, it, it, it usually the value you give is the amount of, like will proportionately equal to the uh, the amount of money you make. So you know, like Elon Musk, right? He created Tesla and SpaceX. And because of that, he created a bunch of values for people. You know, the biggest value that I've seen him, him do recently is the development of Starlink. I mean, yeah, the, the value in how many times have we gone traveling and we didn't have service, mm -hmm. Internet in these royal areas. Yeah. And now you can have a star like dish, you know, a satellite dish, essentially. And you can have Internet in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. That's insane amount of value. Exactly. So like if you're like struggling right now, you're like working like this like dead end job and you feel like how the hell do I get out of this? Um, just figure out like how can I bring more values to not just people around me, but like my clients and things like that. So if you approach it with that mindset, you're going to start thinking like, okay, so if I have to bring value, that means I have to solve problems, right? The bigger the problem you can solve, the more money you make, right? How do you make a sandwich? I can solve the problem for fifteen dollars an hour. That's <laughs> right. That's kind of right, fair, right? Right. Right. Well, how do I connect someone from a halfway across the earth, like instantly, with a like, and I can see their face? How do I talk to, you know, um, Henry from England, halfway across the earth, like right now? I want to do that right now. How can I solve that? And if you can do that, you make so much money. And that's what like the internet does. That's what Apple does with their phones. So. You know, it kind of makes sense why they make so much money. Wow. Is there, do you think there's more value to in, I mean, there probably is more value in less people doing a certain thing. So like, let's say like life coach, right? They're not 
technically producing any stuff or items, but they help they help a lot of people, and it's hard to put like a lot of like prices in like you know things they coach and stuff like, like that. Like Tony Robbins type stuff. Yeah, yeah, right. So I mean, it they he does help a lot of people getting out of like situations. So obviously he's getting paid based on the problem, like the quality of the problem he solved. Okay, I can see. I can see what you're saying. I like that a lot, dude. I've been hearing that a lot lately. More is value. Like I've been hearing more. Okay, so I've been hearing value more. Like what's mm -hmm. the value? The value? The value? And then don't think of a salesman as a salesman. Think of them as a problem solver. Yeah. And how can they assign a value to what you need? Like how? What, what can they find what is valuable to you? Yeah. Right. I used to hate selling, um, but that's something you gotta start Take learning care. as a creative. Is like learning the business side of things. Yeah. It's a it's a hard like hump to get over because you just want to produce the best work and sometimes you don't really see like your worth that much, but well you know what you can do too if you don't like to sell stuff because selling is essential and like yeah. you're always selling your stuff is you can I've heard this plenty of people they say well I just want to do art I don't want to make videos I don't want to talk to people you can do that you just have to hire somebody else to do the selling for you essentially yeah. right like you can always do that there's always that route but I wanted to bring up you were in. Windows Aries. Okay, yeah. What were you doing down there, dude? Oh, just taking a dump. You know, <laughs> best dump of my life. <laughs> I did not expect that. That was, good. that was a good one, dude. That was a good uh, one. Well, just taking uh, a dump one of my South America. One of my couple. Dump. I met them. Um, they photographed a proposal, and they were like, "We want to elope, but we want to go somewhere cool." So they picked South America, and then they picked me to go over there. Um. Which is funny because I only met them like a year ago and they have a bunch of other photographers that are, you know, pretty talented, um, but they pick me. So that's one thing is that like we're connected so much like me and this couple. We have a lot of things in common. So, like we both lis uh, listen to like the same kind of music. We look at life the same way. We have really similar values. So when we go over there, they just couldn't, they, just, they couldn't fathom thinking about like, well, we just hire somebody else instead. Like they can't. It's not like on a table for them. So uh, that's why I got to go over there and photograph their wedding. That's so sick, dude. It was sick. We, was it a uh, good time? No, horrible time. <laughs> Awful. <laughs> um, uh, so we went to Santiago and Chile first, and then we hop over to Buenos Aires. It's a beautiful areas. city, man. Santiago? Holy shit. Pretty cool. Um, mountain in the background with yes, like the cityscape, dude. right? Holy cow. A little boring, though. Is it? It's, uh, people are a little cold. Um, but you also say cold? Cold. Yeah, not as welcoming. Oh, but I was only there for like two, three days, so I didn't get a chance to go out mm. that much. So mm. don't take my word for it. Just try it for yourself. Uh, but in Buenos Aires, we went to like El Calafate, which is like the town. Um, it's like a dirt back town, dude. It just feels like everybody's there just hiking and like just living off their backpacks. And there's more cycle with like a bunch of luggage on the back everywhere. In Buenos Aires? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, no. In uh, El Calafate. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's like a, like a town in like Patagonia. Okay. So we hiked this place called Fitzroy. And it's a hike where you gotta um, take your backpack out. You camp at the base, and then you hike to the top where there's a lake and like the mountain view. Essentially, um, that's where they got married. Is they hike that last part to the top of the. How long of a hike is that? I think it's six mile there, six mile back, maybe maybe ten mile total. Damn, so you um, gotta have couples that are that are willing to do the hike. Yeah, yeah. so they're pretty outdoorsy. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't super hard. Uh, the first stretch wasn't super hard, but the last mile was like fifteen hundred feet of elevation gain up like a mile. So just just climbing the entire time. So we woke up at three a.m. Uh, we well we went to bed at like t uh, midnight. So we only got three hours sleep. Woke up at three a.m. Uh, put all our shit together. Hike up this like mountain in the dark. And there's a lot of people hiking it too, not just us, because it's sure. a really famous um, peak. So we got up there and got to the top. We got like a fucking eleven year old kid hiking with us too, because it's like their kids. Oh. Yeah. Um, a badass that's uh, cool. went up to the top and they did their ceremony and read their vows up there it was pretty epic that's sick yeah dude. and one of a friend his name is Derek he's an officiant for um, the wedding uh, he's one of our friends he just like you know what I love cold plunge I'm gonna go jump in this icy cold glacier water and dude was just like bare like naked like hey Sam can you record me going in here I'm like <laughs> dude what is this I don't do this kind of shit so he was like alright so he jumped in he's like got it out this whole like you know cold plunge or whatever he walked back toward me like can i stop recording now like no i want me walking back in it's like you're totally naked his dick was just hanging out like dude i can't do this anymore this is violating <laughs> it's, it's so fucking funny dude. 
That's fucking yeah. crazy. He's, he's, he was, he's hell of a guy. He's great. They um, do that a lot in fucking Washington, too, up in the... Cold Plunge. Yeah, but they get butt naked and they record themselves. This is on top of, like, Fitzroy in, like, the glacier, like, lake. Yeah, so they it do was, that. It was, in, it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, they do that in Washington, too. I've seen, like, this one guy was showing me, say, look, I went in uh, this lake I went to, and it's a picture of, wait, one of his friends butt naked from the side, so all you see is his ass cheeks and stuff, right? But I'm just like, no, no, no. F- Derek just walked toward me with his dick dangling. Oh, no, I'm saying they, they they definitely were doing that there. But that's not what I saw. I just know like that they do that shit, dude. They get fucking butt naked and yeah. they jump in this ice water. Good for you, apparently. It is, um, but you don't have to be butt naked. You can wear some underwear. Yeah, but we we have to be butt naked because if you do that, you got to hike back down because there's no change of clothes. He didn't bring change of clothes in. Um, it was like a last minute thing. It's like, dude, I kind of want to Oh, so I guess it's it. too cold to get his underwear wet, I guess. Yeah. Oh, okay, and then okay. hiking back in that wet yeah, you're gonna shave and you're gonna die. Yeah. I got you. I got you. Okay, I got you. So, that's Puno Aires. It's pretty cool. That's pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. Where where have you uh where have you been? I don't want to ask you a broad. I think earlier I asked you too too broad of a question, which tells and teaches me how how do I ask better questions to pull out certain information that pops in my head to become curious. Uh, but. You know, I, I love stories, and I'm thinking if you went to Buenos Aires and you did that, you probably got some pretty other. Some some other pretty wild, you know, crazy stories. I'm sure. Yeah, there's a bunch. A bunch um, of them. Yeah, we uh we almost ran out of gas uh, in the middle of nowhere because was this we were, the same trip? Same trip. Okay. Uh, it was like this giant, long, giant road. It's like Highway 40 or something like that. So we almost ran out of gas. Um, let's see. I can't think of on top of my head. I have to look at my. Well, that's what I'll I'll, yeah. I'll 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 see if I can prompt you real quick. Um, let's see. I think I wrote it in here somewhere. Did you backpack across America? Um, or uh, not America, Europe. Europe, yeah. yeah. So I did that. My friend Remy was like, "You want to go backpacking with me?" I'm like, "Fuck it, I'll send it." <laughs> it's my first time like going from hostel to hostel to hostel. It was great, dude. Um, we were not prepared at all. We were um in Switzerland, and because it was so last minute, I was trying to get some booking off like hostels and stuff like that. And apparently, it's a really popular like town in like Interlaken, so I couldn't get a hostel. Like, I couldn't find a place to stay. Packed out. So. Uh, one of the night, I have to crash a hostel. So I just slept in like the, the lobby of a hostel. <laughs> I didn't know I was there. I had to steal like a little wristband from their counter and I put it on me. <laughs> and then I just kind of like bounce around the hostel, sleep on sofa. It was great. Um, but we were hiking this hike called Hot and Gratz, right, in Interlaken. And it's this really beautiful ridge line. Um, you take a tram up to the mountain and then you hike the ridge line. It's long. It's like 12 miles, I think. Either both way or one way, and at the peak is Matterhorn. There's your alarm for your uh, for your phone call. Yeah, with that that client phone call but before you tell your backpacking story across yeah. uh, Europe. Can I just go do that real quick? Yeah, no, yeah. dude. Uh, we'll pause it right now. Uh, we're at an hour fifteen. I'll write down my piece of paper so when I'm editing later, I'll see it. Uh, but we're at like an hour five of actual talking. That's perfect, dude. Yeah, that's dude. I'm excited, man. That's sick. Yeah, that's a that's a really cool story behind that one. Actually. Okay, let's, yeah. let's get right back to it in a second. We're back from uh, back from our commercial break. Back from the dead. Back back from the dead. Yes. <laughs> uh, dude, what were we talking about before? It was a trip to Switzerland, mm-hmm. and you. Sl- I think the last thing we said was you slept in the. Oh lobby. yeah, so uh, we were hiking Hot and Gratz to the like Matterhorn like peaks. Essentially, with like really cool hiking like. Still good? Okay. Still good, yeah. yeah. Just double checking. So like we were hiking to uh Matterhorn and then the trail is called Hutton Gratz. It's pretty like pretty hard to hike, but it's one of the most beautiful hike ever, dude. It's like you're on a ridge line, right? And everybody who's afraid of heights is gonna hate this. Um it's like a mountain like this. And the entire time you're on the ridge line, you're hiking. And if you fall and trip, you can just like roll down the entire mountain. It's great for me because I love that shit. <laughs> um but one time as we're hiking, we weren't prepared at all. I we didn't have like tent, we didn't have like sleeping bag uh, or whatever. Like we just have like, you know, uh, we got like blankets and stuff like that. And uh, we went up there. We had like two giant water uh, water bottles, and I dropped one of them at the beginning of the hike, and it just rolled down the hill and it's gone. So we only have one wa- giant water bottle to split between two people. Uh, we barely have any food. <laughs> we weren't even prepared at all. Maybe like five granola bars. That's all we got. And we went to the top. Uh, it was like one of the most beautiful sunset scenic thing ever. I took a photo of this, like the stars, um, like a, essentially like the galaxy and the Milky Way mm-hmm. at night. 
with the, the city view on the background with the lake and the mountain. Dude, so cool. It sounds really nice. And then we just slept underneath the stars. And the place we slept was this, like, because the entire thing was a ridge line, right? There's no, like, flat place where you sleep. I think the entire, like, spot we slept in is probably the size of, like, this table, maybe a little bit bigger. God damn. But just two people. Maybe, like, a little bit shorter than this. So like, a maybe small like, area, man. Yeah, maybe, like, this big and then maybe, like, two more of my, like, arm length. So we just, like, curdle up and just, like, slept there. Hopeful, hopefully we don't fall off. I mean, that's, like, again, like, a ridge line, right? So super cool. Like, when you wake up, you, like, put, like, you put a blanket all of your face and then you just look over and then, like, this is death right here. <laughs> it's, it's great. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I thought you were going to be like, when you wake up, you look out and you see the, the sunrise or the clouds and you see other mountain peaks. And you, oh, nah, no, those are good, too. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> those are death. good, too. Dude, yeah. That sounds crazy, man. Yeah. And we made like little coffee in the morning because I had a little jet boil thing. Mm-hmm. So we just made like warm coffee. Dude, so cool. We were roughing it out there, though. When a friend woke up, he's how, like, How long were you in uh, Europe for? Like three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, man. dude. Where'd uh, you go? So, like, first was Paris for, like, you know, 24 hours, then Switzerland, uh, hiking in Interlaken, went to, like, uh, Latinbun, which is, like, these, do you see the picture of, like, the waterfall coming down from the the cliff to the to the church area? Is that in Switzerland? Yeah, that's in Latinbun. I've seen that, yeah, yeah because so they that's usually we do the video in the summertime when everything's mm-hmm. green before the snow. Yeah, yeah so yeah, that's okay. Latinbun. That's really cool. I feel like I was in, like, Narnia the entire time. That's great. Damn. And then we went to, you know, the Dolomites in Italy. And it was my first time renting a car in Europe. And I didn't realize it was all manual. So it's manual car. It's pure drive manuals over there. The automatic cars, they exist, but they probably don't really, it's not really common. Mm-hmm. So I just went to this little town in Italy, went to this gas station would have six car in a lot and just pulled up like, hey, I'm here to like rent the car. And he's like, this is your car. And it's walked in. Fucking manual. And so I'm like, I don't know how to drive manual. So I had to figure it out how to drive manual from there to pick up my friend. So I, I had stalled like three times. But it wasn't that bad because I know how to drive a motorcycle. So I kind of know how manual okay, works. Okay, so you knew how to drive a motorcycle beforehand. Yeah. Okay. okay. But again, like manual car, like, what the, what the fuck? This doesn't make any sense. Like, yeah. why is my clutch back here instead of like up here where my fingers are? Right. So I stalled three times, got hung a bunch, but like. Figured, I figured it out eventually. So. Are the roads in Italy on the left side? Uh, are they reversed? I think certain part of Europe is still on the right side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it was a it was a fucking um, a Fiat Panda. So this tiny little car of me and Remy getting in. And we weren't planning on staying in a hotel. We went to go to Dolomites. We were planning on sleeping in the car. So <laughs> this entire time, we just in a tiny little Fiat Panda <laughs> driving to the Dolomites. Beautiful place. Um, and we slept in... This tiny little car, it's so uncomfortable. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, dude, it was like roughing it out, just car camping. It's in the car, it's like, doesn't even lean back. It doesn't yeah. even lean back. Um, but that was really cool. Crashed my friend's drone a few times. That was great, too. Um, and yeah, and after that, I kind of, we, sep- we went on a separate way. She went to Amsterdam. I went to Sardinia in Italy, okay. which is not a really common place that people go. People don't really know where it is. But I saw it on TikTok. Like when I was in Milan and I figured out where I'm going to do next for the next like five days that I have in Europe. So like, this is a cool place. So I book a plane ticket and go to Sardinia. Like zero plan. Had no idea how to get there. Book a hostel last minute and just like made friends along the way. Um, once I got there, book a trip to go like visit different like beaches along the beach um, in Sardinia. And because it's not really known in America, people would just speak like Italian, Italian and like, you know, Spanish and whatever. And I have no idea how to navigate myself around there. Lost my phone out there. Oh, shit. Yeah. What really sucks is it's not my cloud storage isn't backed up. So I lost a bunch of like videos I took oh, in Europe. Oh, that's unfortunate. Which is really shitty because of what happened to my friend. It's like, you know, not having, not having like images and photos of like him and I. So like losing those memories was like. like <laughs> big, yeah. 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 Especially it was cool like place too but uh i met this random girl on the beach and we were like vibing a little bit um we were gonna hang out but because i lost my phone i couldn't figure out where it is but we ended up meeting each other again at the pier when we got back from the tour and she like 
took me to a grocery store or like uh like a supermarket i had mm. to get a new phone and i had this like shitty flip phone for a while and i had to use that to like navigate through the entire like you know trip back to america and that was like this 40 dollar phone dude <laughs> it's like a 40 dollar android phone it was awful like quality was awful but it's still like get got me through yeah but when yeah. i come back to america i didn't go back home right away i had to go to washington state um where i have to hike up this mountain and wait for my friend derek and stephanie at the top because he's proposing to his girlfriend and Stephanie thought I was in Europe this entire time. So uh, that's the couple. So that, that was, so they had no idea. That was the couple, that, the $60 dress. Is that the same couple? The No, that, that's the couple that went to Patagonia. Oh, okay. Yeah. They went to Patagonia. Okay. okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So gotcha. that's Derek and Stephanie. So Derek and I have been talking about this for a long time, and he's like stressed the fuck out every single time. It's it's great being a proposal photographer and be like hearing the backside of things, like how dudes stress out about the proposal. Yeah. Um, I like to think that proposal is for the guy and wedding's for the girl. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Usually, that's kind of how it goes. Yeah, I didn't think about it like that, but it it is it is because the guy's proposing. Okay, usually, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I bet she had no idea then, because if she thought she were in Europe, then yeah, she had no idea. No idea, cause she she knew what you did before, right? Yeah, because I was posting on my story that I was in Europe and stuff like that. Ah. So, like, yeah, when I was at the top, I was like, "Hey, Stephanie," and she turned around like. What the fuck? <laughs> That's great. That's Love too cool, man. That's too cool. Um, you, we were mentioning the hostels, how everybody's super friendly at the Dude, hostels. Dude, everybody, everybody should backpack in their life. Everybody should like go backpacking at least once in their life. Really should. It's such a cool life experience, man. And you learn so much. Like The world is such a better and more beautiful place when you travel. And especially when you're like traveling, like backpacking and stuff like that. Especially when you're young. Uh, it's different in hotels because hotels are more for like, you know, older people. They have your own room. Here you're sleeping with other people. Right. And because you're in that environment, it's just so easy to make friends. It's great. Yeah. I've only been to one hostel and yeah. it was the coolest experience ever, man. It was the coolest experience. One of the guys was from a country called uh, Uruguay, I think, mm -hmm. in South America. I didn't know it was there. Um, and uh, or it was maybe it's by the way or however he said it, but his name was Martinez. And, uh, yeah, just talking to him was super cool how they have, he was making, I had an iPhone SE at the time. This mm -hmm. was only uh, a year ago. Yeah. I had an iPhone SE and he was making fun of me. He's like, what is this little smartphone? What is it? And I was like, this guy's from some country. I have mm -hmm. no idea where it is. And he's here in America making fun of my phone. Like <laughs> you just, it kind of brings you back to reality that there's a lot of other places like America. Yeah. Um, but anyways, I met somebody from uh australia that was a roommate as well he had this thick australian accent he was telling us about australia and stuff and it was just so cool during breakfast time going to eat the food it was like some toast and grapes and shit like that seeing everybody from all over the world man like brazilians mm -hmm. and uh colombians and Germans, I, you know, people tell me I look German yeah. because I have blue eyes. Oh, really? Dirty blonde hair. I think oh, you're white skin. and you look german -y? What's that? Well, you're, you're white and you look like Germans? Well, it's because my hair used to be more blonde because mm -hmm. I used to be in the sun a lot more with that mm -hmm. hat on. And my eyes are blue. So, gotcha. Uh, naturally. But no, there were some like German Germans there, right? Gotcha. The blonde hair, blue eyes, mm -hmm. just walking up the stairs. And I'm looking, I see that. And then I see some Brazilian girls and, and yeah. hearing all these accents and different languages. I'm like, holy shit, this is so exciting. You know? I know, right? Everybody's so friendly. Um, we were in the hangout area and there was three girls that we were talking to because um, they were with they were with some other people and we we're talking to all of them. I can't remember where everybody was from, but mm -hmm. um, one girl was from Wales. Wales and, and her uh, accent, Australia? yeah, uh, no, no, uh, England, oh, well, uh, the okay. UK. Oh wait, I think right? it's different. Okay, yeah, yeah. So she's from Wales, and her accent was so thick that I could barely understand what she was saying in English. So, but anyways, please continue. the 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 hostels are like the coolest experience ever. I think uh, it's funny I say please continue. And I'm going on. I think that <laughs> hotels are kind of like travel prisons. Mm -hmm. you, Can I continue now? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I think I, I'm just I, kidding, go for it. No, go. I think that I think that hotels are travel prisons. Yeah. Because you you go and you don't know anybody and you're like, well, fuck, I'm just gonna go up to my hotel room and hang out. Yeah, and sit in a room. But if you're in a hostel, you're forced to talk with other people. Yeah. You're forced to meet people. And it's weird to not socialize when you go to hostel. Yeah. Yeah, like if you don't talk to anybody, everybody thinks you're kind of weird. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. It's like, why are you not talking to us? Like this is you know, like what what's wrong with you? Like your mom just died of cancer or something? Like, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, doesn't it kind of remind you of the military too when it, you kind of 
sleep in the barracks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Showered like 20 naked dudes. Yeah. Well, not that part. No, not it, but, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what hostels you're going to. Oh, no? Okay, well, let me refer you to this. <laughs> it's called the United States Military. <laughs> um, but the, this definitely the sleeping in the bunks. And like we had this mm-hmm. conversation like, hey, guys, what time y'all like lights out for yeah. you? And they're like, I go to bed at nine. I go to bed at 11. Don't worry about making noise, brother. You can have a good time. Because I told him, hey, we're going to go out and come back at like 2 a.m. Mm-hmm. And we'll be quiet, you know, and just communicating. It was yeah. just cool. to. It just felt like the military again in a way. Yeah, it does. It feels like the sense of like brotherhood. Everybody's in the same kind of like situation, right? Everybody's traveling. Everybody's doing something. So it's just your sense of like survival is like heightened when you're traveling, especially when you're at a hostel. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, one of my buddies, the one I told you that speaks multiple languages, mm-hmm. uh, he has met so many people being in hostels. Uh, actually, he's trying to go to Brazil because he met them at a hostel uh, here yeah. or in Colombia or wherever it was, I forgot. And, you know, it's the same thing. They're like, hey, why don't mm-hmm. you go here? The girl that I had on here, uh, her name's January. Mm-hmm. Um, she said that she met a girl who she was just like, hey, do you want to go to Switzerland or something? I forgot where it was. But anyways, they just, on a whim, just went. Yeah, and that now, happens. Yeah, and now they're going back to Portugal in June. And I just thought, wow, this is so cool. I think, like, today, man, this goes into a good segment real quick. I think, like, today, people think that normal human interaction is kind of weird. I really hate that, that it's becoming a norm. Yeah. It's one of the things why I really vibe with American culture and not, like, Thai culture. Um, cause in Thailand people are a bit more reserved. You don't say hi to strangers in America. You, you do when you go to Europe, they don't say hi to you like stranger either. Like in Italy, if you just say hi to like random people that whack past you, they're like looking at you weird. Like why? Mm-hmm. You know? So there's that. I mean, for me, it's like, you know, I, I, I like to go up to strangers and take pictures of them. Yeah. Right? Cause that's it. <laughs> yeah. Right. And some people think that that is weird to walk uh, up to a stranger and take a picture like that's weird right i mean but if you look at it in in the past though and, and back history before mm-hmm. social media was around and yeah and people were more connected with themselves mm-hmm. that's what you did you walked up to a stranger or you mm-hmm. met somebody and like hey let's go take some photos kind of like that same experience you have in the hostel where it, it, you don't know someone so very well and they're like hey let's go do this let's go do that let's go do this it's just people just do shit. Yeah. To where today we're, we've seen all these serial killer movies and all this bullshit. And we think that's going to happen to everybody. Kind of like the fear of sharks. Yeah. Eight people die a year of sharks, mm-hmm. but we're always terrified because we saw Jaws. Right? Yeah, it's exactly. Just, it's just the wrong perception on Just reality. don't watch the news, man. I feel like the news is so <laughs> bad for you. Like, just I don't have a TV in my house. Like That's good. Yeah, because it's just so toxic. Like That's why the news are so addictive because it just spreads so much negativity. Yeah, and in reality, we're not that different. We're not that separated. Um, we're, we're the world isn't that bad. You know, the world was pretty great. Like we're living in the most peaceful time. Like right. if you were to look at like history of like human, right? Like there's right. war going on everywhere. The best time ever, right now. Right now, yeah, yeah. Super grateful to be here for sure. Where where else have you been besides backpacking in uh, Europe? Um, let's see. Went to Australia, so that was Sydney? fun. Australia, uh, Sydney. Went to Cairns went to like the Great Barrier Reef, then went to Indonesia for a little bit. Oh, um, yeah, that was that was a good time with the military. So we learned how to catch snakes. Um, there was some wild story, dude. Some Indo- Tell me, man. Indonesian soldiers are wild. Are so they? So we were training with them, right? So me and my team were just gathering in this like kind of like gathering area, and it's their turn to teach us something. So they're like, "All right, come come over here, everybody." And we're just like, okay, what's going on? They have a huge box and they open the box up and they dump three cobras in front of us. Like where I'm sitting again, like from you, that's where the cobras are. It was just like right there. And we're just like chilling, like, oh my God, what the fuck's happening? And they're like, but don't worry, we're going to teach you how to catch it. I'm like, motherfucker, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> it's right there. Um, so they taught us like, hey, if you want to catch a snake, stuff in the back. And they just slowly like walk your way through like this. And like we're at the entire time, we're just like, the fucking snake's gonna turn around, go like like bite them, right? So it did. The fucking snake like rode up this way, and like was just facing the guy, like the soldier, like an Indonesian soldier that was like catching it, and dude just straight went on the snake and go, <laughs> and then keep doing that, just smacked it, yeah, just smacked the goddamn <laughs> snake, like nope, 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 <laughs> and just keep going. And then at the end, the uh, snake was like about here. He was having it like about here. 
and then he grabbed the head and then pointed it down because when you catch a cobra, you can still like spray like poison. So mm-hmm. you catch the head, um, squeeze the mouth together and point it down. Oh, okay. Yeah. And from there, you're free to do whatever you want. Sure. And that's yeah, when we thought the whole thing was over. It was not over. He's like, all right, congratulations. We all clap. And like, the class is over. We survived. Like, no, no. He's like, all right, from here, you know, here's the head. You kill, kill Cobra. You know, like, speaking a thick English accent. He's like, it's like 15 centimeter from the head, right? And then it's a kill. And he's like, a kill here. I'm like, what do you mean kill here? Do it straight up, grab a snake, like stretch it out and just yank out his teeth and just split it in half. Yeah. And then he just go drinking cobra blood. It was great. <laughs> we're all like, yeah, that's amazing. So we're like, can we have some of those? So, so I had a taste of the cobra blood. So that was pretty amazing. What was it like? Dude, it tastes like Skittles. Like Skittles. I'm just kidding, man. It, it tastes like blood. <laughs> what the fuck? Um, it tastes like human blood, just a little bit more like watered down. You know, out of all the bullshit, I that feel you like said, I got 15% speed since I drink Cobra blood. You think so? Yeah, definitely 15% uh, you know, speed. Out of all the, the the BS you've tried to catch me in, uh, that was the most gullible moment I had because I kind of, for a second, thought maybe it did taste like Skittles. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> for a second. I haven't believed anything else you were trying to bullshit me on, but that one thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, not, a lot blood, have, dude. not a lot of people have taste cobra blood. So, no. I mean, it could taste like skittles. That's crazy to think, too, that they're just showing you on like a king cobra. Yeah, dude. Super, super fucking venomous. Like, I mean, kill you. These guys are like, they don't have any fear. Have you been bit by a snake before? Mm-mm. I have. I and that was the same thing. It was a chicken snake. It's seven feet long. And it just it goes to show you how if you fuck up when you're yeah. going to grab the base of their neck and their head. Mm hmm. It, it could have consequences. I yeah. mean, thank God this was not a poisonous snake, but I was a teenager and I went to grab it and I went to grab it by the back of the head mm-hmm. and pinch it with my thumb on its head. I missed and I was at the base and it turned around and it bit my hand and then it yanked around and bit my hand again. I got bit twice in a matter of just Damn. a second. And, you know, it's like little pin needles in okay. there, little blood's coming out a little bit. Nothing, I hate snakes, dude. Know? I can't do snakes. Yeah, and I, I go yeah. up to the, the house and I, I, I showed Dad the, the bite and then I showed him the snake, yeah. you know? And... uh my mom is panicking and she's saying, you know, Donnie, Donnie, is he going to be okay? Is he going to be yeah. okay? And my dad makes the joke. He says, well, we'll find out in about 15 minutes. <laughs> Survival of the fittest, man. If he <laughs> dies, he dies. What am I going to yeah, do? We have, you know, I'm one of 10. So he, you know, in his head, he's like, well, I got nine more. So yeah. Okay. Well, it's What's disposable. <laughs> <laughs> um, where else have you been? Um, Let's see. Your mom's house. Um, I'm just <laughs> Just kidding. Um, that, was, that was good. That was good. Like well, that. I was born in Thailand, so that's one. Japan was one. That was cool. Um, I keep thinking I've been to more. You know, I don't know a lot about Thailand. Thailand? I don't know a lot about it. Is it a big country or is it smaller? Mm, I imagine it being it's smaller. It's not super big. Compared yeah. to America, every country is small, right? Well, sure, because America is just huge. Yeah. So, like, kind of Thailand is probably the size of, like, you know, some of the East Coast states, I would mm. say. Maybe a little bit bigger. Okay. I'm not sure how to compare it to, but... Beautiful, tropical country. People are super nice. Um, a lot of things happen in Bangkok. Not a lot of things outside of Bangkok, except like nature and stuff like that. Mm. Lots of stray dogs. So, you know, got to have some thick skin when you go over there. And see the dogs. See some dogs on the street. It's like don't take one of the people that wants to rescue every animal. Though, yeah. Scoop no, it's sad, man. It's really sad. Yeah. I, yeah, I saw a bunch of stray dogs in Mexico, too. Probably a lot more in, in Thailand, if I but I'm taking. Uh, I'm hosting a trip actually to Thailand. That's why I'm going back. What part? Um, Bangkok. Bangkok and Phuket. So it's a week long trip where it's like if you can go to Thailand for a week, one time in your life, this is a trip to go to. Um, so essentially, I'm trying to create the best experience possible where I'm blending in all the popular spots people would like to go see, like Ko Phi Phi, go go see the elephant in the sanctuary, go see temples. So but Ko- also, you say Ko Phi Phi. Ko Phi Phi, Phi Phi uh, oh. Island. Yeah, oh, okay. It's like what James Bond's like film. Yeah, isn't it? Um, okay, I know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. those area. I've seen it. Beautiful. So those, you know, cool area, but also like kind of showing like the other side of Thailand, but people don't really see where, like where I grew up. Because sometimes when you travel, you don't want to go see all these like touristy spots. You want to go see like the real thing. Like, how do people live? Mm-hmm. Where do they go shopping? Right. Things like right, that. Right. Yeah. So a blend of culture and like you know cool spot. Yeah, I I know what you mean. I, one of the girls I had on here. Um, 
Juliet, she went over, I forgot what uh, country she went to, but it was the same thing. She mm. said she didn't want to see the touristy shit. She wanted to go actually see the culture and learn about them yeah. and how they live and stuff like that, you know? And I, I yeah, I definitely agree. It's a better experience. We definitely sure. have like a bunch more. Um, Thailand's just so free. I know America, we have like a lot of like freedom is a big thing in America. Like everybody say freedom, freedom, freedom. But I feel more free in Thailand in a way. Really? How is that? It's weird to describe. Uh, if you haven't been to a third world country before, um, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. But there's not there's there are rules there. There's traffic rules, right? You're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to do that. Um, but it's kind of like a wild west. People just do whatever they want to do. Mm-hmm. Like even if some if something happened, it's like oh shit, you know, tough luck. In America, like something happened, you make a law about it. Like some something, some new bills get passed, and then you can't do that shit no more. In Thailand, it's not like that. Um, I remember like as, in, as a kid, like in my mom's car, listening to a radio, of, like news happening. It was like some bus driver that was drunk and drive, uh, and hit like 10 people at a bus stop. Right. And in America, if that shit happened, it's like, this is like so chaotic. This mm-hmm. is like a sad story that like, we got to do something about it. They're going to let's build some barricades on this bus thing. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do our safety is at hand. In Thailand, it's not like that. It's kind of like, oh, shit, tough luck. Maybe your next life, you'll be born better, you know? Wow. You know, we believe in reincarnation. So it's not yeah. like, um, I feel like that does, in a way, affects the way that we look at life. Um, death isn't really such a big thing. So safety isn't really as big of a topic in Thailand. Mm. Like in America, safety, everybody's like, oh, we got to make sure that safety is the first priority, right? In Thailand, it's like, nah, just send it, you know? And if, well, yeah, I think in America we we do uh, we do want to see people uh, be safe and, and yeah. obviously not get hurt. But I think more of it's it good. from a business standpoint though is legal issues. They yeah. don't want to deal with all the legal repercussions because yeah. in America, uh, you know, you could be robbed by gunpoint or you mm-hmm. could be robbed by pen and paper. Yeah, right. And a lot of other places are not like that. You know, exactly. Um, so, there's so many laws and rules here, and there's the lawyers have so much money, and the companies have such retainers on mm-hmm. big lawyers and. You know, I've experienced that myself with, uh, you know, uh, a tenant renting issue. It's like it's going to cost me way more money to get my money. They, they robbed yeah. me. They robbed me. And I can't do anything about mm-hmm. it because if I do, I, I'll lose more money. Yeah. So, like, it's one of those things where, like, you know, like this good in, like, having rules set in place, right, to make sure that no one gets taken advantage of and, like, everybody's get treated fairly. But in Thailand, let's say you want to set up a restaurant, you can just, like, set up a restaurant and like you put like a bunch of chairs on the sidewalk and then like use it as your like front restaurant mm. and no one's going to say shit about it. Right. Because it's kind of like, um, well, we're just trying to make a living. You know, it's just not like on. the safety, like, oh, you can't sit up table at a sidewalk. I'm like, dude, no one cares. Like food tastes amazing. I'm going to go, you know. Uh, but again, different culture, different part of the world. But that makes it, it's, that's why I feel more free out there because like you can just kind of do whatever you want. Mm. Not as safe though, that's for sure. Not as safe, yeah. That's a, I was gonna say that's what I felt in Mexico. Uh, I didn't feel as safe as I do in America, mm-hmm. and that could just be perception. It could be the fact I didn't have my guns with me because I, mm-hmm. you know, I've had guns since I was a little kid. Yeah, little bitty kid, I've had guns. Yeah, always had guns. I used to sleep with a gun. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and so just having a gun makes me feel safe. My biggest, my three biggest things in my life that are important to me Mm -hmm. is that I'm happy, I'm healthy and I'm safe. Those are my three most important things. Mm. And I will not budge on any of that. And so when I travel, I will lose maybe the safety, yeah, maybe the health because maybe I'm not immune to certain things they have in other places, whatever. But you know, here where I live most of the time, I want to be those three things. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like that for me at all. Cause like, (laughs) I was just like, you know what, man? Um, like I asked myself three questions like do I have to do it like should I do it and is it fun that's about it like if mm-hmm. I have like something that I think about like you know uh, let's say like I gotta edit this photo do I have to do it yes okay then I gotta do it but like if it's like something that I don't have to do something that I maybe like shouldn't do it but if it's fun yeah send it yeah I guess I, for me I see myself as the uh the bearer of the family, if I will. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a middle child. So I always mm-hmm. felt like I was breaking up the fights. I was always trying to keep the peace and I was always caught in the middle of everything. So I think for me, it's that stuff is very valuable to me because I see myself as 
uh, the person who did leave the yeah. state and I did make a change and I'm doing everything I want to do and setting the example. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember that uh, Sergeant Thomas in, in the Air Force when I was trying out for pararescue and I quit. Uh, one of the things he said it was a huge hard school, dude. That's a hard school. Superman school. Uh, pararescue. Yeah, I yeah. was. Yeah, I was BA prep for eight weeks and then two weeks in in doc dev and then a little a little less than three weeks and I quit mm-hmm. in in doc. Um, and it was it was that was what changed my life. The military didn't change my life. That changed my life. Mm. Right. Um, I could have gone with the last two years of my military service not be in there because it was pretty much the same thing, just extended. Gotcha. Uh, but Sergeant Thomas said he said uh, you you need to be the light of a sh- on the on the what did he say? He said you need to be the shining light on a hill for your family. Mm-hmm. You're like the uh, the lighthouse. Yeah, they look up to you for everything. You're the one pulling the weight. You're the, you're setting the example. Mm-hmm. You know when there's a question, they ask you. Yeah. When there's you know an answer, they they get it from you. And so that's kind of the way I see things. It's like I want to set the example for my family, and mm-hmm. and so that's the main thing why I want to be safe is that reason. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. See, I didn't really grow up with family. Like I said, they sent me in a box over so to America. Just, yeah, you're just like I'm a- by myself since I was 15 years old. Um, so it's like uh, just be wild, man. Just Buck be wild. wild. But uh, lately, I know family's important, right? So like, I have a little brother, but just one. He's in Thailand right now. So I might bring him over, kind of like teach him the ropes a little bit because he's kind of don't know what to do with his life. Mm. And my dad's retiring. So when you hit that age, you're like, hmm, should be responsible. Yeah. But also just plane ticket though, you know. <laughs> how, how, how much is that? Thousand? Twelve hundred? No, like to, to go like to backpacking. Like the plane ticket to go backpacking. Like choosing between responsible. Oh, yeah. to go. Oh, okay, yeah. I got you. Yeah. Like this, this ticket to like Argentina though. Hmm. That sounds pretty fun. <laughs> like, sorry, little brother. Next when time. you, when you went down to Buenos Aires, was that the first time you've been down there? Yeah. That was pretty cool to be like in a different continent of the world. Have you been to South America before? Mm-mm. No. First time? No. Nope, that was my first time. Like, it's kind of remind me of Thailand a little bit because it's still kind of like the wild, wild west. Like, just not a lot of rules. Mm-hmm. You know, the city's a little older. It's kind of nice, but still developed. Feels like Bangkok. Yeah. 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 I know you didn't. Do you know the joke for uh, Thailand? Uh, that's how I, I've known the the joke since I was a teenager. Do you, do you know it? Wait, <laughs> no. It's like, no. What's, the ca- what's the capital of Thailand? And you're like, oh, what is it? They Bangkok and they fucking hit you in the dick. Oh, <laughs> that one. Yeah. <laughs> that's how I know. I've always known what that is because somebody's like, what's the capital of Thailand? I was like, I, I don't know. And he's like, Bangkok. Fucking yeah, not, I think I know. Yeah, it yeah. just dropped me. Holy shit! Uh, but yeah, I, Buenos Aires looks pretty nice. I looked at Montevideo and Uruguay. I think mm-hmm. it's right there as well. Where uh, do you want to go? Like, do you have a destination in mind that you want to go? to? I after going to Mexico, I think I like more of the European style. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I I want to go to Portugal mm-hmm. uh, to the beaches. It looks like a nice surf. Dude, Portugal has some of the coolest landscape. Yeah. They're so cool. Um, I mean, if you want, you can go to Thailand. Honestly, it's they love tourists there. Yeah. Yeah. I've never really You might get raped, but you know, it's great. <laughs> also a word of advice though, if you do go to Thailand and you think you're talking to a girl, I know it's you're not talking to a yeah, girl. Yeah. That's, that's why I'm not there. Yeah, that's yeah. what I've heard. Is there's a high there's a there's a high number of of uh, transgender women in Thailand, which is um, actually really funny if we on this topic. Um, it's Thailand super accepting of that, but it's a different, it's a different kind of like dynamics. Even though we have more transgender and more accepting, they don't really consider them, consider themselves um, a different gender. Um, so in America, it's like if you're transgender, like let's say you're a man transitioning to a woman, right? You want to be called like let's say a woman. But you're like, but you're not a woman. So like, we have this like discussion back and forth in America, right? In Thailand, it's like, no, I'm not like. If you're a guy, turns into a girl. It's like, no, I'm not a girl. I'm a lady boy. Oh. And then it's just like a totally different thing. And it's like, they're not expecting you to, you know, like call them in a diff any like anything different. Um, and we don't treat anybody different either. So it's kind of like, kind of like nice that you don't get told to like they they if you call me wrong, you go in jail. Because I feel like that's happening in Canada. Um, They're doing some weird shit up in yeah. Canada right now. I don't know, man. The only thing they got going on is Banff and like maple syrup. <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're just, dude, in Canada right now, the stuff I've heard that they're doing, they just sound like they're turning into a socialist country. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I think socialism is good in some aspect. You need police, you need fire trucks, you need, you know, like teacher and things like that, right? Um, if you want to take out your trash. But if it's like everything, if it's like all the same, it's like, oh, I don't know, man. Mm. I feel like pendulum do swing left and right again, just kind of like photography. They like, do. And that's what's the nice about the United States and why the idea of the United States when we made it mm-hmm. was so great. It's, I think we forget that it's not America. It's the United States of yeah, America. I mean, exactly. There's 50 states that are united mm-hmm. to fight together, right? Yeah. And so you have Republican, mostly Republican states and Democratic states, and yep. uh, you have your Southern states. So that's why I ask people, say, if you're from America, what part of America are you from? Are you from the South? Are you yeah. from the Northeast? We're so different, dude. Oh, I, dude, I'm, I've been across America. I went all the way up to... Uh, South Dakota and all the way across to Washington and the down here to the Arizona. And so I've seen a good bit of the landscape. I've been to New York and different places. Mm-hmm. And America is literally so many countries fit into one. It really is. You go we down just south happen to speak and, English. Yeah, yeah, we happen to all speak English. You go down That's south and they're like, hey, what's going on, brother? How you doing, man? It's, yeah. listen, you know, roll tide, man, roll tide. And then you go over to California and say, oh, man, we're going to go here and get so pitted, bro. And yeah. it's just... And I know those are being dramatic. Yeah, you go to New York, say, so what the fuck you want? <laughs> yeah, they're like, hey, I'm walking. Yeah, I can't do that accent <laughs> at all. But yeah, it's just so much different. And so that's why I think America, the idea of it is so good, is that it is so many different states, so many different countries, states mm-hmm. that are combined together. Yeah. And we're seeing that right now with the, the border crisis with Texas saying, no, you're not going to cut the wire. And then, you know, the federal uh, government saying, yes, we're going to cut the wire. And then you have this clash of state. And then you have all these other states that are saying, I think, 27 plus states, Arizona mm-hmm. being one of them, saying, no, we we are with Texas on this one. You yeah. Know? And so it's this unique dynamic of a lot of places that are united. Yeah. I like to think of like, like with the whole like cutting the wire thing. Like, look, if it's if you're from New York, like how are they going to know what life in Texas is going to be like when you cut or don't cut the wire? Because they don't get affected by it as much. Mm. Texas is on the border. So, like, they're the one that's going to get affected the most. So they should have a say in what they want to do with their border. You know, I know we're like a United States, but look, if you, it's your house, do whatever you want with your house. Like, I'm not going to tell you what to do with it. But Well, since, so, since you've been to so many countries and you've been around the world and all these different places, how do you feel about, and I don't want to get too political with you. If you don't mm. want to answer these questions, you don't have to answer them. Uh, how do you feel about seeing so many homeless people, like, for instance, down here at the park? Mm-hmm. You know, when we were kids, you were you, know, you got here at 15. I'm sure yeah. it was the same way. You could go to a pavilion at a park, and mm-hmm. there was birthday parties. Yeah. And there were celebrations, and there was these, you know, baseball parties, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and families were together, and they enjoyed that. But now... The homeless people have taken over all of these parks, all the pavilions, all the coverings, mm-hmm. every nook and cranny. Yeah. There's a homeless person. There's free syringes and needles, man. You don't like those? The free syringes and needles? On the ground everywhere, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, Trash. I'm, I'm good. You I'm, don't like that? Oh, okay. Oh, no, I was good. a big fan of needles. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but so, because like, you know, in America, yeah, I could sit here and tell you being from Alabama in a Christian place and yeah. it's traditional and things are done around, you know, I'm gonna get my accent mm-hmm. on here. They're, they're done this way and this is how my daddy's yeah. done it. And, you know, but a lot of, of um, us Americans haven't been outside of America and yeah. seen other places. So when we see it, we're just like, Argh. but being other places that you've been around the world, how is it? Do you see such a country with the, you know, the electronics we have like cell phones, TVs and all the luxuries we have. Um, how do you see this stuff with homelessness and, the poverty mm. and stuff on the streets, you know? Well, um, I think it's just kind of, oh, first off, it's like, it's just shitty to see. Yeah. Right? Like, so that's one thing. Um, I'm not sure how to, uh, like, what is my perspective on it? Like, how to solve it? Or? Well, not how to solve it, but is it that bad? It's not that bad. Okay. Honestly. Because, like, you go to Thailand, like, you can walk on the side of the road, like, because people walk everywhere, like, public transportation. I've seen worse stuff, you know. Granted, they're not saying that like we don't have a problem here. Like we do mm-hmm. have a problem here, right? But we there's problem everywhere. Um, I don't know, man. I think just have to be control. That's like how I think about it. It's just I don't know. I don't have an opinion on this. <laughs> well, yeah. I I the reason I say that is because I know when I went down to 
Mexico and I just saw more poverty in the mm. way there's trash and there's stray dogs. And yeah, that's kind of like what I grew up seeing. So yeah. I'm like, yeah, homeless people, you it's, know. Yeah, it, it is what it's it is. Sad. It is what it is. Um, and I kind of felt a little less sympathy when I came back. Mm. Naturally. Oh, yeah, 100%. I felt less yeah. sympathy. Dude, people have it so much worse. If you live in America, you have access to internet and like cell phones and clean water. You're super lucky to be here, you know. So, I don't know, man. Yeah, it, it's hard for people to kind of, you know, like, like the law of physics, right? It's harder to get started than it is to keep the motion going. Mm -hmm. So when you're in that dark place, when you're homeless, it's hard to get things going. Like if you try to apply for a job or something like that, I do have sympathy for those people who are like, okay, yeah, it is harder for you, but at the same time, it's not an excuse to do nothing. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, so. It's just the way it is, man. It's yeah. It's yeah. a it's a weird conflict now because I don't have any uh, hatred or bitterness towards the homeless people themselves. I have more of a question or a concern with the state of <clears throat> the way things are ran. That's more of my thing because I, I feel bad for both sides. I feel bad for mm -hmm. the homeless people, and then I feel bad for the people that want to enjoy their taxpayer dollars and take their kids to exactly. the party at the park. It, I just honestly like it doesn't really cross my mind that much because yeah. I like to think of myself as control what you can control mm -hmm. granted you can like if you want if i want to change the world and like go into politics i probably can but i just value my happiness more than i that, oh that'll take it away politics yeah. would take it strip it yeah. away yeah so give just, it 10 15 years and you want to be the same person yeah i don't want to have gray hair <laughs> i don't have family and normal things and a golden retriever at some point <laughs> dude gives you one man i'm telling you they're great know, dude. Have, let them make them have babies so that way they get them. <laughs> they're both fixed dude they, oh god damn it they're, they're unfixed done. them <laughs> that bloodline is gone for them man god damn it. um but uh no dude before before we before we end i really uh I want, well i want to say there's a lot of good information that you shared i appreciate it i I would like one more story if you could for okay. travel because i i just be five dollars no five dollars yeah shit yeah i'm broke i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> I'm five dollars away from being out there. I'm just kidding. No, just kidding. Uh, no uh, just one more story. Cause I I really do like the stories a lot, man. I really do, and they're really uh, kind of eye opening to see. Uh, well, I think we all like stories, don't we? We like to, you know, the campfire stories where you kind of mm -hmm. live in your life through somebody else telling you about it in a way. Yep. Right? Isn't that social media? That's pretty much social media. And you're living your life through somebody else doing it. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. way more, you know. It's nicer when you have campfire and, and marshmallows yeah, it is than it is better. on your phones. Yeah. yeah, it is a lot better. It is a lot better. So one more story. So you've been to Europe and South America the first time. What about Indonesia? Well, no, you told me about the snakes over there. Like Japan? Japan. That's a great place. Japan yeah. is a cultural shock for me, even mm. though I grew up in Asia. People are so like, it's a really collective place, right? Have you ever seen that experiment um, of the poster and dots? No. So they essentially have like just white, you know, piece of paper and they have like a bunch of red dots for them to like stick the red dots into the paper. And there's no rules. There's no right or wrong way to do things. But they do this in every country. And majority country, they both grab the dots and the, the red stickers and just put them wherever they want. Right. And they, you just have like cluster fucked up like red dots everywhere. In Japan, like everybody, like it's lined up perfectly from the top to bottom. And it's in a straight line like this. So it's kind of embedded in their culture in a way where like it's a really collective culture. If you're a kid in Japan, you can walk out and take subway, transportations, and you'll be super safe. There's a show in Japan where a kid and a monkey go do chores. I used to watch this as a kid, like a six-year-old kid and a monkey go do chores for like the parents. Wild, dude. Um, because in Japanese culture, like, Kids are considered like everybody's problem. <laughs> well, I said problem, but like responsibility. Sure. Right. So it's super cool to just go to a, such a clean, clean city, clean place, and everybody's like just you know it's it's so nice, dude. Japan's so weird. But with that said, because it's such a collective thing, um, they don't value individualism as much. Mm -hmm. So like when you have like cool ideas, it doesn't really get pushed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Tattoo isn't really a thing. So you go to Japan, you got to cover your tattoo. Um, you go to a gym in Japan, you have to wear a long sleeve. Like, I have to wear a long sleeve. So, but food, dude, I can live there. Like, foods are amazing. Yeah. It's so great. So healthy. They live super long. Like, they eat fresh sushi and uh, 
That's amazing, dude. One of the longest living places in the world is right Japan, Spain, places like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they also were doing studies. Um, there was this particular, like, I think village or town in either Europe or America where they have zero heart disease, um, like, case, like, zero. And the neighboring town, which is a few miles away, have heart disease. So it can't be genetics. It can't be, like, anything that's outside of that. So we're doing studies, like, why is that the case? And it turns out um, that village have like a really small population and they everybody know each other so they essentially were as walking down the street seeing their friends and family and then walk down the block they see their friends and family again so they're just constant social interaction and i feel like in an age where technologies are becoming such a like prominent part of our lives and it's meant to connect us together it's kind of bring us apart mm. right uh, and that really hurt us in a i think it's gonna in a long way we're gonna become more lonely as time progresses you know, everybody can have their own things. Everybody have their own house and cars and like place to work. You know, we're working in our own like living room. And in a sense, yes, it's nice to have that individualism. But it's really going to hurt you because we're social animals. We're going to want an interaction. That's why travelings are so cool. That's why hostels are so cool. Because we get to meet people. We get to talk to people. And because the world is becoming such a lonely place. Traveling isn't isn't such a bad idea, you know. Dude, I love that man. You really crushed that 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 spiel, dude. I got to wrap a tie to a bow for your <laughs> little podcast. <laughs> that was perfect. You had me fucking <laughs> in trance. No, I, so uh, isn't it? Isn't Japan like this place that's kind of like the West in a way where it's very productive? Like they're go 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 go. Yeah, um, there's a there's a term called salary man. So once you get paid salary, you become a salary man per se. And you work, like, if you leave work before work ends, it they will look at you to kind of dirty. Because, mm-hmm. like, you're this. supposed to, like, work really hard. Um, so you see people get drunk on the side of the street uh, on their way back to work, sleeping on subway because they're just working all the time. It's a little tired. But it's just a part of the culture to, like, work, 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 work. You know, it's an honor thing and something like that. Mm. Which is, I guess, is something we could use more of in this country. You know, but again, they're just leaning right to that side and america is leaning left into the side so yeah that's hard to say where the what, what's next man because it's such an interesting time because of because of ai is coming out mm-hmm. right and that we, we're seeing robots like uh, tesla's making their robot right that mm-hmm. is, can pick up an egg and it looks like a human and i mean this is all this stuff is happening rapidly so imagine in 20 years and this is what i'm saying the, mm-hmm. the it's almost unpredictable what's next because yeah we're social animals we're seeing a disconnect with our technology, like you said, with their cell phones. Mm-hmm. But then what happens when the robots replace our workforce? Here is, what do we do? It's kind of funny thing you say about AI. When we first introduced AI into um, a society, we thought we were going to replace like truck drivers and like factory workers. That isn't the case. It's replacing a lot more creative works. So a lot of more like okay, it can create like graphics. It can like create songs. It can write you poems. It can write codes. So all these creative tasks are actually being replaced first and not these like labor tasks. And now I think it's just kind of sad and it's cool that we can do like it can take out like images and create something new, right? Like remixing, Mm -hmm. but, um, and, and then an AI image actually won a photography award. Yeah. I heard about that. So that was crazy. I heard about that. So when you take away creativity, you know, from humans, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, it's not going to be good because expression is like the center of who we are as we want to express ourselves. And we do that through language, dance, arts. Exactly. You know. Yeah. So I don't know if AI is the way to go. I, again, I like to draw everything back to nature. I like to take things from nature and kind of tr- draw the truth from that. If nature is saying that we're a social animal and we love like, you know, like working with our hands and like we like interacting with people, anything that kind of take that away from you, it's going to hurt us more. And I know it sounds like a good idea to introduce all these stuff, but I really do miss the age where, like, we don't have the internet, you know? Or as much. I mean, even in when I was a kid in the early 2000s, we had the internet, yeah. but we people weren't on it that much. I mean, you had, like, your... Uh, you had your MySpace, but it wasn't, like, a normal, everyday thing. Exactly. Was, you play, like, with Yu-Gi-Oh! card. You play with Ruby's Kill. Oh, we, you, we did. You play we fucking soccer. played so much Yu-Gi-Oh! Dude, so much, so much. And it was Yu-Gi-Oh. the most bullshit game ever because you could just 
interpret everything the way you wanted to. Yeah. Like, this it, is, I have a trap card. It's like, I have a trap card to your trap card. And yeah, exactly. It was, it was great. A, it was hilarious. We used to have, we got those, uh, you know, the me- mechanical things that would pop out. To I have one of those too. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Me and my little bro would be like, I do take four duel. Halo. The biggest thing about Halo, I don't think people understand why I love Halo so much, except for the fact that a lot of my childhood, that was like my escape is if I could play in a Halo game. Mm-hmm. But the fact about Halo is, is Halo is a unite. It's a u- it's a uniting of humans to mm-hmm. fight an alien species that's not us, mm-hmm. right? Because all the war games are centered around killing each other. Yeah, and the re- reality of it is, we kill each other. Yeah, Halo is this different thing of the you know the UNSC was we could fight a different species for you know humanity together, mm-hmm. and that was what was so cool about it. it was just like this uniting thing, you know? Yeah. So you know just. I'd say we can just not like if they should have a day because we have like a blackout days at some point, like we have like technology just turns off. That'd be nice, dude. That'd be wild. That'd be crazy. That'd be nice. Can you imagine when I went down to Mexico? That's what I told my friend. He had service. I said, well, look, you have service and you speak Spanish. I, I'm not going to buy a service for Mexico. I'll be fine. I'll be mm-hmm. fine without service. And I was because he had, you know, he had navigation and he knew how to speak the language. And so I wasn't concerned about it. I was actually happy not to have service Mm -hmm. back then but isn't it such a cool thing now today when we have such cool gear like we have our mirrorless cameras and we have our 360 cams Mm -hmm. action cams we have our our nice gear that's well tested and it works good like Mm -hmm. my low pro bags and stuff like that and we can go into nature with this good technology this good equipment yeah and we can really just soak it all up but it's the the key factor that we're saying is is just getting rid of the internet yeah so it's it's not like getting rid of an internet. I feel like... Or disconnecting, I should say. Huh, this is a hard topic to fucking talk about, man. Because, like, I do make money out of photography, mm-hmm. right? It's made me, like, able to have this, like, beautiful life that I have now. So taking a camera away isn't really, like, something I would like to say, like, this is a good thing. But um, it's not like you're changing the way we're talking. It's not changing the way of life. Per se, because we paint on a wall as a as a caveman, right? You're expressing art. You're making art. Photography is just kind of like a, a device that help you do that better, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't change the way that I interact with you, right? Instead of me spending two hours painting on a wall on a picture, I can take a picture and show it to you. That's like that's cool, but like when AI become a thing and then like social media become a new way of interacting, it's changing the way our society like work and like how human interacts. And it changed in such a fast pace that it's not good because human body, we're biology not wired to do any of that stuff. So I don't think it's good, but it's coming. And if you don't be a part of it, you're going to get left behind. And in a sense, I don't know if I'd rather be left behind in my like ignorance or, you know, progress into this futures of like despair. <laughs> That's a tough one, man. That's a tough one. I think keep the camera, but disconnect i think you treat the internet like a battery mm. you you go out and you do your thing for a couple of days or whatever and then you come back and then you utilize it to connect with everybody again but the problem is is that the internet remember when we were kids and teenagers mm. and you wanted to do something you had to go meet somebody you yeah. had to hit up your buddy you could call them or yeah. you could just go knock on their door exactly. and you say hey let's go do this let's go fucking do this and like nah mm-hmm. nah man i want to no nah, come on let's go fucking go man like, yeah. don't be a bitch like let's go you know yeah um uh, but the problem is today is like we have the ability to connect with anybody at any time it almost seems like too many resources like there's too many options yeah which leaves you in this place of not doing anything exactly and it's terrible for dating for dating mm-hmm. oh yeah i could see that yeah, because you think you have a lot of options. It's just giving an illusion that, like, there's so many things out there, no one committing to anything. And, like, even though you think you don't fall for it, you do fall for it. Mm. Okay, I could see that. Do they use their the social media? I, I feel like they do in other countries. Do they use it as much as we do in America? More. More? More. Yeah. Huge thing over there. It's like a, a huge thing. It's like they almost have a another life on online. It's kind of gut wrenching to hear, though. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm like, I, I do love Thailand, man. But like, sometimes it's like everybody lives on the internet almost. Like this app called Line. There's an app. Yeah, it's almost like a Facebook, something like that. And I can see that in the culture of people when it, in, through photography. So like in Thailand, it's like when you do a wedding, 
they have a pre-wedding photo shoot where the couple will go take photo of in their wedding attire. And that's a really common thing. It's almost like they go create art and like want to look as cool as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people there create some beautiful work. But it's kind of like, why are you doing this? Just showing up on internet and post online and look really cool. Like I get that. Like you want to create something really cool. But at the same time, like when you have a wedding, like it's all about the people that, you know, loves you and it will be there for you and capture those moments and not trying to impress people that you probably will only see a few times a year uh, in your life, you know? Isn't that the hard balance is trying to figure out how can I live the moment, mm-hmm. but then take just enough time to capture it so I yeah. can relive it again later. So that's why you hire a photographer so you can just go <laughs> live and then I'll capture everything in the most beautiful way possible. That was the best marketing thing ever. It's like, try to sell me a pen. It's like, yeah. write this down. Link down below. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Link down below. Yeah. It's like, like you, like you said, unfortunately, your friend, you don't have a lot of pictures together mm-hmm. and you wish you did. I think I know me, my brother FaceTime me the other day and he's like, remember when we were in Seattle and we did this and I had no memory and then he sent mm-hmm. me a picture and then all of a sudden, all these Everything memories come just back. come rushing in and it's just, we took that split moment like you did earlier, not to take a thousand, you know, selfies. You just took, you just took a selfie. Yeah. You have it. So now when you're going through your phone later, your photos, you're like, oh, shit. Yeah. I remember that day. Exactly. Yeah. I try to take a snippet of everything a little bit. Like, you know, a podcast, I took a selfie of us. So. And, the, you know, that's the thing, too. There is a blessing about uh, podcasts is it's a way of journaling mm-hmm. while you're working. Yeah. So, for instance, when I take photos of people on the street, when I watch do, those. You make me want to do podcasts now, man. Yeah. <laughs> when I watch the videos of me on the street. I remember things. I remember, mm. I remember their names, the way I felt, the the temperature, like that. Maybe I remember something about that day, like I had a really good sandwich or something, something random. And I kind of relive that moment. Um, same thing with podcasting too. And I re-listen to it. I'm like, oh shit, wow. You know, right now, most of the time when I re-listen to my podcast, I'm thinking, how can I do it better? Mm-hmm. But there are certain moments and there will be more in the moments in the future of like, oh yeah, I remember that day and like what we talked about and like this and how I felt about that. You know, it's just all these things. What I've been trying to do when I go on uh, long trips yeah, is I try to do voice journaling. Okay. I don't like to take the time to write it down. It bugs me. It's irritating. I have to re-erase and re-erase. And mm-hmm. how do I write it out? It's just better if you just say it. Because you can just say, hey, like, blah, 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 it's yeah. today's day. You know, like when I was going to New Mexico, I'm like, my my neck's hurting really bad and I'm really sleepy. I stopped at this place and got a coffee. And you're kind of giving yourself these hints. So later on, when you're re-listening to it again, you, these certain things can make trigger memories. Yeah, because you know? your brain connected it with like trigger points. So if you have things to trigger it, you will come back. That's why I can't like tell me a story. Like, I don't know what to tell you. But if you ask me about um, like if have you lost a phone? I'd be like, I can tell you about the time I lost my phone in Sardinia, you know? So. Well, tell me about it, man. I told you about it. <laughs> oh, wait, the, Sardinia? Oh, yeah, that's the, yeah. Swiss, is that Swiss? In, in uh, Italy, yeah. Oh, in Italy, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I think, I was thinking for some reason Sardinia was its own country. I was thinking of like. Uh, Almost like its own country. Is it? It's uh, like an island on the west side of Italy. Is that that island that was that split? It's like, you know how like the shoe of Italy come down? Yeah. And then there's like this island on a, on a side. Yeah. That's yeah. Sardinia. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because one of those islands is split. They had a civil war and they broke into two pieces. Oh, mm. there's my timer there. It broke into two pieces and they had this, I uh, watched this YouTuber, uh, a couple of YouTubers united. They went over and there's this strip down this island that is uninhabited. They told everybody to leave. Gotcha. And that's their mutual free zone. So everything's just abandoned. All the buildings, the huh. streets. It was one of the most popular uh, tourist destinations, I believe the 70s. Mm. And now it's just completely a ghost town. Gotcha. And on both sides of it are two countries that mm. are doing their thing. Interesting. And they go is. visit. Yeah. It would be crazy. Uh, and a lot of the families, they brought the families in there so they could see. And they, they're not, not allowed to go into their houses. Think mm-hmm. about this. They had their houses. Yeah. And the government told them, you're leaving and you're never allowed back. And when they opened it up to the public, they opened it up the roads, but they have everything roped off to where you can't go to your house. So he was saying, like, I have letters from his his wife who had died in the house that he never got because he had to, you know, leave quickly. And they're still up there. You just can't go get them. That's fucking sad. And they're from, you know, 50 years ago. Crazy. Right? Yeah. So it's just this weird conundrum. You're looking at it, you're like, that's such a weird thing. It's like when you see Chernobyl. And you see the Ferris wheels mm-hmm. and the cities and everything. You're just like, it makes you feel weird. 
like I am legend type stuff. Like someone tickling your balls? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck, dude? <laughs> All um, right, man. I think it's a it's the time to to mm. to cut it off. I have to uh go to a real estate class in uh nine minutes. Hundred percent. Nine minutes. But uh Sam, dude, appreciate it, man. Dude. The conversation's been great, man. Um let me know. So for people that don't know or are listening, uh your social media website, you this know. This is where I plugged in my stuff. This is this is where you put the link in below. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I own a photography company called Fearless Elopement. Uh, Fearless, what is it? Fearless? Fearless Wedding and Elopement. Okay. But the URL is fearlesselopement.com. But that's social media, same thing. Okay. Personal, My personal one is Aloha Sam I Am. So that should be easier. Easy. Aloha Sam and Fearless uh, Elopement? Yeah, Fearless Elopement. Fearless Elopement. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that sounds good, Sam. Well, dude, appreciate it, man. Cool, man. Thanks for having me. All right. We're going to cut out of here. Bye. All right, peace.